um, over here. Mr. Chair. Oh, there, Senator I, Ellis, I'm uh, sorry. I also would like to point out that 62 years ago this week, Chuck Grassley started his political career in the Iowa State Legislature. And I, I believe we, I shared a picture with him this week, <laughs> and I believe that picture was him debating uh, Iowa statehood. I'm not sure, but... Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> And I also reminded him that he gave birth to his political career a year, year after my mother gave my birth. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I will tell you that I, I'm also fearful of what I just said because one year I did something like this and he took a quote from me and put it in his campaign brochure. <laughs> I received telephone calls from Iowa Democrats saying, what are you doing? So, so don't do it again. <laughs> I'm also, I want to thank the members on the Republican side. The majority of them handle themselves professionally in the best traditions of the United States Senate. Senator Sass in Nebraska is not here, but I want to thank him particularly for a comment he made, which has been quoted uh, widely, in which he used the term jackassery, which I had <laughs> never heard before. Uh, and I thank him for that observation because I think there was great truth in what he said. I wish I could say that across the board. Uh, on my side of the aisle, I'm proud of all our members, particularly proud of one member who spoke at, a right, at the right moment. My, my wife is my go-to critic of what's happening in my political life and on this committee. And she said when Cory Booker spoke yesterday, it cleared the air finally and refocused us on what we were doing and why we were here. Uh, and I have to tell you, his statement will uh, go down in the annals of this uh, committee and the United States Senate uh, for uh, the impact that they had at the moment. I wish I could say that for all of the things that have happened over the last uh, 72 hours, but I can't. Some of the attacks on this judge were unfair, unrelenting, and beneath the dignity of the United States Senate. You can disagree with a senator's vote you can disagree with a judge's ruling, but to draw conclusions that really reflect on them personally and their values and take the, to, to the extreme is unfair whether the nominee is a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, I was so saddened by that, and it happened over and over and over again. Uh, and I'm, I hope that that is not the lasting impression that people have of the work of this committee. My lasting impression is a judge who sat there through it all, head, head held high with uh, dignity and determination and strength. Uh, a lesser person might have picked up and told her family, we're leaving, this is beyond a pale. She didn't. And it says an awful lot to me about her character and why the president was correct in choosing her to be uh, the next uh, Supreme Court justice. Before we turn to questions, I want to turn to Senator Grassley for opening remarks. I have no well, that's new. <laughs> now let me turn to the ABA panel. Before you make your opening statements, I'll swear you in. If you please stand and raise your right hand. Do you affirm the testimony you're about to give before this committee? Will you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth so help you God? Let the record reflect that the witnesses have all answered in the affirmative. Judge Williams, please commence. Good morning, Chair Durbin. You need to turn on your microphone. All right. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Durbin and Ranking Member Grassley. Uh, you were at both of my confirmation hearings, and, and, and yes, so a thumbs up to you, Senator Grassley, and other members. It's an honor and privilege to appear before this committee. Thank you for the invitation, Chair Durbin. I'm a retired federal judge, as you said, and chair of the American Bar Association Standing Committee on the Federal Judiciary. Today, I'm joined by our two principal evaluators, Jean Vita, D.C. Circuit Representative and Joe Drayton, uh, the Federal Circuit Representative. Our Vice Chair, David Brown, deeply regrets that he is unable to attend, particularly since he was the principal evaluator of Judge Jackson's D.C. Circuit nomination. For almost 70 years, the Standing Committee has been asked to present to this committee our peer-reviewed, independent, nonpartisan, comprehensive ratings on the professional qualifications of lifetime appointed federal judges. The standing committee is made up of outstanding lawyers from every circuit with varied backgrounds, professional experiences, and practicing in law firms 
with six to 2,000 lawyers. We don't give suggestions on who should be nominated, don't recommend or endorse any nominee. We don't base our ratings on or express any view of the nominee's philosophy, political affiliation, or ideology. Nonpartisan peer review evaluations are the hallmark of the standing committee. We began our work on February 25th, the day Judge Jackson was nominated. On eight, March 18th, the standing committee voted unanimously that Judge Jackson earned our highest rating, well qualified for an appointment to the Supreme Court. Why? Quite frankly, well qualified was a rating we were compelled to reach after our exhaustive, comprehensive peer review. To get that well-qualified rating, a Supreme Court nominee must be a preeminent member of the legal profession, have outstanding legal ability, have exceptional breadth of experience, and meet the very highest standards of integrity, professional competence, and judicial temperament. Everyone we talked to, interviewed, or had substantive contact with uniformly gave the highest praise, brilliant, beyond reproach, first rate, patient, insightful, impeccable, A plus. We contacted more than 2,800 judges and lawyers, including federal judges from 50 states, 13 circuits, 94 districts, as well as state Supreme Court justices, law school deans, and bar associations. We focused our confidential interviews on those who had firsthand knowledge of her legal abilities. We spoke to federal prosecutors, defense counsel, civil lawyers who appeared before Judge Jackson, her judicial colleagues, and judges and lawyers that were very familiar with her career before she became a judge. We created three reading groups to examine over 240 of her published opinions and other writings because the principal way Supreme Court justices communicate is by writing opinions. Opinions that touch the lives of people throughout this nation for years to come. Two academic reading groups from the University of Illinois and Stanford, co-chaired by each school's dean, working independently, 37 academic experts. An 18-member practitioner's reading group viewed the same writings. The majority, former law clerks to Supreme Court justices, justices appointed by both political parties. Most have regularly argued before the Supreme Court. Their words, strikingly talented, even-handed, exceptional, thorough, respectful. Finally, we went beyond what Judge Jackson does in the courthouse. We looked at the other contributions she's made on the Governing Council of the American Law Institute, the United States Sentencing Commission, a bipartisan commission, Chief Justice Roberts' appointment to the Judicial Conference's Defender Services Committee. Representatives from every organization said again and again, humble, brilliant, consensus builder. The question we kept asking ourselves, how does one human being do so much so extraordinarily well? Reflecting the combined views of more than 250 judges, attorneys, and academics, the Standing Committee concluded that Judge Jackson is well qualified to serve as an associate justice on the Supreme Court. I now turn to Jean Vita for more specifics on the findings from judges and lawyers, and then Joseph Drayton with comments on the reading groups and the breadth of Judge Jackson's experiences. Thank you, Ms. Vita. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Grassley, and members of the committee. My name is Jean Vita, and I am the co-lead evaluator of our committee's evaluation of Judge Jackson. In assessing the professional qualifications of federal judicial nominees, our committee considers three factors, integrity, professional competence, and judicial temperament. I will address each of these factors in turn and explain why Judge Jackson readily meets our well-qualified rating. In evaluating integrity, our committee considers the nominee's character and general reputation in the legal community, as well as the nominee's industry and diligence. We surveyed countless lawyers and judges at every level of the federal judiciary, and all regard Judge Jackson as possessing the utmost integrity. 
Reviewers describe her integrity as beyond reproach, impeccable, and of the highest caliber. As one reviewer put it, you write the word integrity, and then you put her initials next to it. Another reviewer said, Judge Jackson has a well-deserved reputation for the highest level of ethics and integrity. Based on these and many other laudatory comments, the Standing Committee concluded that Judge Jackson plainly possesses the highest integrity deserving of a well-qualified rating. In evaluating a nominee's professional competence, our standards provide that a nominee for the Supreme Court must possess exceptional professional qualifications, including an especially high degree of legal scholarship, strong analytical and writing abilities, and overall excellence. Judge Jackson ably meets this heightened standard. As summarized by one judge, studying her opinions is like a master class in judicial writing. An appellate jurist stated that she, quote, does a fantastic job of making impenetrable issues understandable. And a litigant who lost a case before Judge Jackson stated, I've appeared before Judge Jackson many times, both in the district court and in the DC circuit. In my opinion, Judge Jackson is one of the very best judges, or for that matter, justices, I have ever argued a case in front of. She is brilliant. Her intellect is simply formidable. And equally important, she possesses all of the other important attributes of a great jurist. She is practical and intuitive, and curious and courteous, and always impeccably well prepared. Given the uniform strength of these and many other comments, the Standing Committee readily concluded that Judge Jackson demonstrates the exceptional professional competence expected of a Supreme Court justice, and thus merits a well-qualified rating. Finally, in evaluating judicial temperament, the Standing Committee considers a nominee's compassion, decisiveness, open-mindedness, freedom from bias, and commitment to equal justice under the law. As part of our evaluation, we considered whether Judge Jackson demonstrated any bias that favored criminal defendants. Notably, no judge, defense counsel, or prosecutor expressed any concern in this regard, and they uniformly rejected any accusations of bias. For example, when asked about the allegation that Judge Jackson is soft on crime, one high-ranking attorney in the U.S. Attorney's Office responded, I vehemently disagree. Another prosecutor, who has appeared multiple times before Judge Jackson, responded by saying such an allegation, quote, absolutely was not borne out based on my experience with her. Instead, prosecutors, like the other lawyers we interviewed, praised Judge Jackson as a judge who considers all arguments before coming to a decision. One prosecutor stated that Judge Jackson was generally regarded by his office as, quote, a good draw, because, as he put it, she is a smart judge without any biases, which is all we're asking for. For these reasons, the Standing Committee found that Judge Jackson clearly meets the well-qualified rating for judicial temperament expected of Supreme Court justices. In sum, because Judge Jackson easily satisfies the highest standards of integrity, professional competence, and judicial temperament, it is the ABA Standing Committee's unanimous conclusion that Judge Jackson is well qualified to serve as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vita. Mr. Drayton, you're with the law firm of Cooley LLP and lead evaluator. Would you please uh, report to the committee what you found? Thank you, Chair Derman. Ranking Member Grassley, esteemed senators, to supplement our discussion, I will share perspective relating to Judge Jackson's writings and her contributions to shaping the law. Various groups of highly credentialed judges, lawyers, administrators, and legal scholars confirm that Judge Jackson has the ability, as required by our standard for a Supreme Court nominee, to communicate clearly and persuasively in a manner to harmonize bodies of law and to give guidance to lower courts and the legal community. And she has done so across a significant range of complex issues. 
Judge Jackson, for example, has served on the American Law Institute in their leadership council, an organization impacting American jurisprudence for close to 100 years. It publishes the restatements of law and model codes, among other things. Her fellow ALI leaders remarked, and I quote, incredible work ethic, very well prepared. Another quote, I would describe her competence in this way, thoughtful intelligence, thoughtful superior competence. With regard to Judge Jackson's service as vice chair of the United States Sentencing Commission, a bipartisan independent agency created by Congress to, among other things, reduce sentencing disparities. Her fellow commissioners praised her contributions, and their collective views are summed up by three quotes. The first quote, she was gracious, respectful, and wonderful to work with. She remained calm and positive, even when debating emotional issues of sentencing policy. She was also very trustworthy, absolutely no indicia of bias. Second quote, she works hard and is committed to the rule of law. Third representative quote, Judge Jackson was a strong consensus builder during her time as a commissioner who worked across party lines. Judge Jackson also served on the United States Judicial Conference Committee on the Defender Services, which oversees the Federal Defenders Program and the Administration of Criminal Justice Act. Quotes reflective of her committee members. <clears throat> Judge Jackson listens carefully, and when she spoke and weighed in, she was persuasive and often would sway the whole room. She is highly respected. Second quote, an independent thinker who brings a different viewpoint to the court. Third quote, brilliant and conversant in many areas of law. I next turn to our observation of our scholarly reading groups. Our teams of law professors and legal experts from Stanford Law and the University of Illinois College of Law, as well as practitioners that includes former Supreme Court clerks, law partners, attorneys who worked at the Solicitor General's office, and veteran evaluators of Supreme Court nominees, all of whom were impressed. One reviewer who argues routinely before the high court described Judge Jackson's writings in a manner representative of the collective thoughts of all three reading groups. And I quote, her opinions consistently reveal a deep commitment to legal process. She identifies and states the relevant legal standards and meticulously applies them to particular records. The hallmark of her opinion is thoroughness. No matter how routine the case, Judge Jackson's opinions precisely and exhaustively describe the applicable standards and doctrinal context, recite in detail the contentions of the parties and painstakingly explains her applications of those legal standards. Her opinions are also structured. She at all times orients the reader to the guideposts for her decision and her reasons for reaching them. Her opinions show no favoritism or bias, close quote. This type of comment is representative and consistent across all reviewers and provides keen insight into Judge Jackson's approach to adjudicating legal issues. In conclusion, Judge Jackson's leadership in the legal profession, reputation among such leaders, acclamatory remarks from each of these groups consisting well over 60 of the top legal minds in our country, further supports that Judge Jackson as a preeminent member of our, the legal profession with outstanding legal ability and exceptional breadth of experience, merits the highest rating of the American Bar Association Standing Committee on the Federal Judiciary, the rating of well-qualified to serve on the United States Supreme Court. Thank you, Mr. Raitt. I want to also acknowledge, as Judge Williams has, the contributions of the two universities, Stanford and University of Illinois, in this process. I want to make a note for the record that virtually everyone involved in it was doing it on a volunteer basis uh, to serve the needs of the profession. And I'd also like to establish one other point. I believe, Judge Williams, you said some 2,800 people were contacted, interviewed uh, in this process, uh, who represented virtually everyone who came in contact with her professional career who was available to question. So it strikes me that uh, this is the kind of scrutiny which uh, is rare, but is, uh, was done in a professional and complete way. So here's the question I have to ask. When you were looking for certain things, 
Over the last several days here in this committee, we have had a handful of senators argue that Judge Jackson is out of the mainstream when it comes to sentencing, particularly when it came to sentencing cases involving child pornography, for example. And, and this was stressed over and over and over and over again. So in the course of your interviews of 2,800 people who came in contact with her, would such of an assertion have arisen during the course of your questioning? Were there people who would have been able to observe whether they felt at a professional level there was any truth at all to that charge? Well, first, Senator Durbin, you said 2,800 that we spoke with or interviewed. We cast a very wide net, so we contacted 2,800, but we actually spoke with 250 judges and lawyers who had firsthand knowledge. We don't rely on someone just saying she has a good reputation. We find out what the basis of that is. Have they appeared before her? Have they worked with alongside of her? Have they been on a committee with her? And with respect to those issues, I'll turn to Judge Drayton. Sorry, Joe, I'm promoting you now. <laughs> I'll turn to Joe Drayton, who actually spoke to various prosecutors about this issue, because it never came up in any of the interviews we conducted. Yeah, Chair sure, General, we did speak to various prosecutors and defense counsel who appeared before Judge Jackson, the majority of them in a child porn cases and child sexual offense cases. And to, n none of them uh, felt that she demonstrated bias in any way. And I can share a few remarks from some of the people that I personally spoke to. And one prosecutor said, I do not observe any bias, and the judge was fair to all sides in connection with sentencing in all aspects. Another prosecutor remarked, Judge Jackson displayed the highest level of competence and integrity throughout the proceedings. Her rulings on the state of the law were reasoned and steeped in authority. And we asked pointed questions as it related to bias, whether it be to defendants, whether it be to the government, and we found no bias. So one of the senators on the other side actually tweeted that they felt that her sentencing in these child uh, pornography cases and sexual abuse cases, endangered children. Those were his exact words, endangered children. Uh, what I'm asking you is, would that have come out? I mean, during the course of your interviews with all of 250 judges and professionals who had contact with her, would such a thing have emerged from your questioning? To the extent that a prosecutor or defense counsel who appeared before in those types of cases felt that way, it would have come out in our interviews. We have confidential interview process that allows us to really have transparent communications with the folks that appear before nominees, and we did not find any evidence of that. No evidence of it. No evidence. And I, mi I might add, Senator Durbin, we went beyond the Senate Judiciary Questionnaire, so not just the individuals who are listed there that the nominee selects, but beyond that to test her, her ability to test her uh, integrity, to test her um, ability to be a fair and impartial jurist, and it never came up in any group. And also the assertion was made over and over and over again that Judge Jackson was soft on crime uh, when it came to prosecution versus defense, uh, that her background as a public defender the fact that she would consider representing a detainee uh, who, was, who was being detained at Guantanamo Bay raised the question of whether or not she was soft on crime. I assume that means releases people who would be a danger to the community uh, in an unfair manner. Did you find any evidence from all the people that you interviewed of that assertion? None whatsoever, and Jean Vita actually did most of the work in that area. And Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, in response to the question you raised, we heard consistently from not only defense counsel, but prosecutors, how unbiased Judge Jackson is. We heard phrases like, doing things by the books. And for example, one prosecutor described a sentencing hearing involving a very high profile, sensitive national security matter. And what she said was, it was classic Judge Jackson. She said, I had my sentencing manual, 
Judge Jackson had her sentencing manual, the defense counsel had his sentencing manual, and we went page by page, and it was a very complicated legal issue that they were trying to work their way through. And what this prosecutor said was that Judge Jackson put both parties through their paces. And what really impressed this prosecutor was that after oral argument, Judge Jackson took a recess, went back to chambers, and when she resumed the bench, came out with a sentence that was more in favor of the government. And what more impressed the prosecutor was that the judge's ruling included arguments and that had been made both by the defense and the prosecutors during oral arguments. So it's not as if she came in to the hearing with her mind made up. She listened to what counsel on both sides said and then came up with a sentence that the prosecution was quite happy with. So from what I gather, and I'm going to turn to Senator Grassley, the facts as well as the observations of 250 professionals belie two of the major criticisms that emerged over the last several days uh, before this committee in terms of the sentencing uh, standards that were being used by Judge Jackson in cases, very sensitive cases, involving the exploitation of children, as well as her general approach uh, against prosecution and defense in criminal cases, led those who were her contemporaries and her peers and worked with her on a professional basis to conclude that she met the highest of the uh, legal standards that one could ask. And I think that is what obviously led to your conclusion, the American Bar Association, that she's unanimously well qualified to serve on the Supreme Court. Your characterization is correct. Absolutely, Senator. Thank you very much. Senator Grassley. Yeah. I think you'll find my tone a little bit different than has <coughs> been sometimes that I've questioned ABA about. Uh, uh, I've been critical of your uh, involvement in this process. Um, so uh, I hope you uh, understand. Well, maybe some of you folks haven't been around long enough to know my history of criticizing the ABA from time to time. So my first question is, does it remain the ABA's policy to keep confidential the names of the people it's interviewed, as well as its material dealing with deliberations and analysis of nominees? Is this information available to the Judiciary Committee? Um, uh, Senator Grassley, that is our policy. Those interviews, the names are kept confidential, the deliberations are kept confidential, and the heart of it and the reason, Senator Grassley, is because we want candid, honest statements from those that we interview. If people knew their names would be associated with their comments, no one would answer our calls. No one would answer our calls. And if our deliberations were shared openly, again, even if we didn't name a name, one might be able to identify who made particular statements. The, the whole key of the ABA investigation, we're the peer I review. I think I'm satisfied with what you said. All right. Can you uh, then tell me how, just give me some justification without having that information that the interviews are not stacked for or against a particular nominee. Please give a short answer. All right. Um, the e evaluators, take what I think is almost like a sacred oath to conduct nonpartisan questioning, to get to the bottom line, to make sure individuals are able to be free to answer the questions that we pose. And Gene, you might want to comment more on that. I think, I think uh, you've answered that okay. okay. What I need to to just hear from you, uh, accepting the legitimacy of everything you've told me to this point, would there be anything wrong with people interviewing it or for members of this committee seeing that material in a confidential environment? Uh, there would be a problem with that, Senator. Because if two people know about anything in Washington, D.C., it's no secret. Well, you are absolutely right about that. We Only one of us that. is from Washington on this panel. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
you gave uh, Judge Jackson a well-qualified rating, but most recently gave Justice Amy Comey, Comey Barrett a minority well-qualified rating. Besides the reading groups, what objective measurements of writing or analytical skill do you use? Well, first, uh, Senator Grassley, if I could make one point. Um, Judge Barrett actually received a well-qualified rating. When the majority votes well-qualified or qualified, if it's a majority vote, the rating of the nominee is qualified, is well-qualified. Well -qualified. We use the very same standard <laughs> for each nominee, and we follow the process with uh, Justice Barrett. I wasn't on the committee at the time. Certainly, our report is a matter of public record, but the bottom line is she received a well-qualified recommendation from this committee, rating from this committee. Give me a, just a rough idea of the objective measurements you do of writing or analytical skills. Well, her analytical skills were excellent, as I recall, from our report. As I said, you can refer to that report. And as I said, our rating was well qualified. Uh, why did you choose to limit your review of her record to her quote unquote over 20, 240 published opinions on the district court? You mean Judge Jackson? The reason we limited, we, we, we focused on published opinions. We focused on other writings, or we had the reading groups focus on those. Uh, and we did not delve into the other orders. Many of those were very short. Uh, many of those didn't really give a sufficient... Um, many of the orders were short. I guess that's the easiest way to say it. And so the published opinions, which people view, we felt were more important to review. We also consult consulted with our academic committees and our, uh, uh, our practitioners group and they felt that those uh, writings that were published would be most appropriate. Joan, did you have anything? Well, and Senator Grassley, on that point, as you know, published opinions among <coughs> within the legal community are those that are relied on for precedential value more so than unpublished opinions. So it was really those opinions she was putting out there for the legal community I might have one question I'll submit to you for answer and writing. Thanks, Senator Grassley. Senator Whitehouse? Thanks, Chairman, and welcome to the members of the panel. I don't know any of you, and I don't know your backgrounds very well, so I don't know if any of you have ever been involved in a um, sentencing proceeding. I have Judge Williams, many, have you? Yeah, I have many times, because I served as on a, the district court district for 13 court years, yes. So. Um, when a federal sentencing proceeding is going on, um, the judge involved, you in the case of your own courtroom, gets recommendations as to what sentence should be imposed from several different sources during the sentencing proceeding. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, one of those sources is the U.S. Attorney's Office. Yes. They're the prosecutors. Yes. And do they customarily ask for higher sentences? Well, let me go, go back. The others who offer recommendations to the uh, court are uh, the defense counsel. Yes. Defense counsel will offer a recommendation on behalf of the defendant, correct? Yes. And uh, the court is also uh, so served by the uh, probation department in all of this, and the probation department also makes recommendations yes. regarding the application of yes, the guidelines? Yes, in a, a pre-sentence report, Senator. Correct. Um, of those three, is it customarily the prosecutor's office that makes the highest sentencing recommendation? Not every time, but is that the sort of ordinary course of events in a sentencing? I can't agree with that statement, uh, Senator. Uh, you're asking me about cases generally. Yeah. And uh, that was not my experience. 
Uh, me, it, 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 it was a mix. Sometimes the probation officer would make a recommendation higher than the prosecution. Sometimes the prosecution's uh, recommendation will certainly, uh, the defense didn't uh, object if it was lower than what the defense recommended. You rarely saw a defense recommendation higher than the prosecution. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. But exactly. all of those were taken into account. And then the sentencing guidelines, Senator, are very a, a, an instrument that judges use because the sentencing guidelines identify a defendant is identified by their criminal history so if you have no convictions you start out as a one you look at the crime itself and their various factors that add the numbers up and then you look at the criminal history number and you look at the offense number and it gives you a guideline range and that's what judges take into account along with what the prosecutor says the defense counsel says, and probation officer says. Is the recommendation of the United States Attorney's Office the appropriate benchmark by which to measure the judge's sentence? Not in my opinion. I think all of those factors that we identified are critical in the judge making a decision. Yeah. Thank you very much. Senator Corner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for uh, your testimony today. And I know a lot of hard work went into uh, the, the, what you've uh, produced here. I want to just ask a question uh, generally about the American Bar Association. Uh, I've been a member of the American Bar Association in, uh, in the past. Um, frankly, on occasion, I've been troubled by some of the public advocacy of the American Bar Association on behalf of the legal profession that frankly did not represent my views. And I want, I'm just looking here at the, for example, at the website of the American Bar Association and under a heading that says what's new in Washington. For example, the ABA president wrote a letter to the Secretary of Homeland Security urging temporary protected status for people who are uh, refugees from Ukraine. For example, that's obviously a matter of great public interest. But some of the areas that um, that the ABA president has also opined on, for example, opposing op opposing certain provisions of Florida uh, legislation, the Florida Senate Bill 1843 and House Bill 1557, which concerns parental rights in education. Obviously, that's another matter of tremendous public interest and uh, discussion in the press and elsewhere. And then finally, I'll mention, because there's a whole long list, and uh, but I'm trying to give you some specifics that hopefully make, make my, frame my question. Um, there is a, uh, there is also a position where the ABA is asking for uh, migrants who come across the southwestern border and claim asylum to provide them lawyers. And um, as you know, there's been 2 million, roughly, people in border encounters in this last year alone. Uh, obviously, the whether or not taxpayers should be required to provide uh, lawyers for um, people who are not citizens of the United States and who are claiming asylum is a controversial matter. So I'd like to know. Um, How should people understand ABA's role when it comes to speaking uh, to these matters? Or, um, are you a, a public advocacy association? Um, and if so, people should be able to understand that maybe some of the opinions you render in terms of judicial qualification should be understood in a larger context. Uh, but I, I'd appreciate if you'd take a stab at, at uh, answering my maybe not great well-formed question but I think you get the drift. Oh, I definitely get the drift. And Senator, I think it's really important for me to make clear the only action that the ABA takes with respect to the standing committee is appointing the members of the committee. We stand alone. The only function that we have is peer review evaluation. So we do not stand for the American Bar Association in the sense that you made all the different positions you outlined. And that's 
purposeful. It's purposeful that we do our work in rating nominees and don't have anything to do with the policies of the American Bar Association. Both Jean and Joe have served on the committee longer and might want to comment on that as well. Certainly. Yes, Senator, as Judge Williams said, we are separate and apart from the ABA. So I understand the questions you're raising about ABA policies and would invite you to ask those of the president of the ABA, because as Judge Williams said, our committee has nothing to do with those policies. Well, you're here representing the ABA, correct? No, sir, we're here representing oh, the standing committee of the federal judiciary of the American Bar Association. Right, but that's part of the ABA, right? As Judge Williams said, we are appointed by the president of the American Bar Association, but that's the only substantive interaction we have with the ABA. Well, I know um, for, in times past, um, the ABA has appeared to be, uh, a, uh, frankly, a partisan during some of the judicial confirmation proceedings that I participated in the past, and uh, that's, that's a cause for concern. I'm not suggesting that's happening here today, and, and I, I take your testimony at face value. Uh, I know you've done a lot of hard work, and, and uh, I appreciate that. That's important. Uh, your voice is important. But it's, I think one of the things that Senator Grassley perhaps alluded to in the past, uh, it's in past uh, some uh, Supreme Court nomination proceedings, it's appeared that the American Bar Association has uh, taken sides, so to speak, in controversial nominations. And uh, I'm not suggesting that that's the case today, but I'm just saying that uh, that causes concern about at whether we should take the testimony of the Standing Committee at face value or whether you're a, a, a combatant in the political battles that uh, rage here in Washington sometimes over uh, judicial nominations. Senator, just let me say there's been no communication of our committee with the ABA about any of our work. It is designed so that we can do it separately. Okay. Joe. And, and, and Senator, what I'll, I will follow up just to say that we're trained to be independent. We basically uh, take an oath amongst our committee members to be independent. And we, we, we focus on the three criteria, integrity, judicial competence, and, uh, and judicial temperament. And so in that regard, we focus on the record of the nominee, we focus on the writings of the nominee, and we focus on the feedback we get from the lawyers and judges that practice with the nominee, against the nominee, and administer justice alongside the nominee. Well, Mr. Drayton, I know part of the questioning of, of the judge had to do with, for example, sentencing that Senator Durbin and others brought up. Did the ABA itself review Judge, judge Jackson's sentencing memoranda as part of your investigation? We re re reviewed the publicly available records for a sampling of her sentencing, including the child pornography cases and the sex offense, sex offense cases. And we wow. looked at the recommendations of the prosecutors. We looked at the recommendations of the defense. We looked at whether she, and she did in fact in some cases, look at sentencing statistics of other judges. And so we looked at the record and how she came out and it didn't appear as though she favored the prosecutor nor the defense in, in such cases. Well, you, you made an important qualification. You said publicly available. In other words, um, and I've heard the chairman talk about his concerns about public distribution of some of the sentencing memoranda. And so uh, you did not review all of Judge Jackson's sentencing memoranda, only a, a portion, is that correct? So, so perhaps I could clarify. The pre-sentence report is highly confidential. Only you, the so judge- You, you the did not review that? No, because it's highly confidential because of the rights of the individual defendant. We could not review the, the uh, pre-sentence report. Secondly, there were not transcripts of all the hearings. You know, if we had a transcript of the hearing, we could review that. But there are memos filed. Those are public. What the position the prosecution takes, the position the defense takes, that is available in a public record, and the dockets are there. So we did as much as we could. 
I understand, Judge. I just want the only point I was trying to make is you did not have access to everything in her record, but you did have access to public, what was public. Is that correct? Yes, and we thought that that was sufficient. Substantial amount of the record. Well, I've, you had me until you said you thought that was sufficient. How do you know if you didn't get access to the rest of the record? Well, in many cases, we spoke to the prosecutors and the defense attorneys. Right. And, and they gave us their thoughts and opinions. And they walked away and said she calls balls and strikes. She's fair. We would ha be happy to go before her again in cases. We also created into her reputation because, as you know, folks talk and they mingle and they're out in the evenings at bars and her reputation is stellar. And so we did query, we, we pressed hard, we asked questions of these prosecutors and these defense attorneys. That's especially true of my experience of the legal profession, uh, Mr. Drayton. <laughs> um, but um, again, these, these people that you talk to are, un, uh, are anonymous to, as, to, to us. They're, they've been unnamed for the reasons that uh, Judge Williams described. Correct. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Senator. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you to all of you for your good work. Um, you know, we have heard a lot from some of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, and not all of them, um, and I think there was a mix of questioning uh, that somehow she would have, uh, the judge would have an agenda of a personal agenda of her own that she would bring to the court. And after hours of listening to her answer questions, um, I think it is pretty clear to me and to anyone that watched the hearing uh, that that just isn't true. Uh, you did a careful review of her background and her record, and I assume you were able to watch some of the hearing. I don't think you were, like, sequestered during the hearing. Um, is there anything in her record uh, or in the answers she gave before the committee that make you believe that she will be anything but an impartial, even-handed justice? There was, well, number one, Senator, we were not glued to the hearings. We were preparing for our testimony. Okay. Okay, Very so good. I can't uh, attest to or, or, or speak to everything, but certainly there is nothing that's come to our attention to change our well-qualified rating. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, I, you know, as someone who myself, I will call it, was in the arena um, as a prosecutor, uh, in my case, hundreds of thousands of cases, over my years and uh, supervising hundreds of lawyers, um, it's always easy uh, for anyone to step back and pick apart any case. I think Senator Blumenthal knows that. I think Senator Whitehouse knows that. You can say someone is too tough, um, which I've heard, or you can say they're too weak, which I've also heard. Um, but I think your review and actually talking to the people um, who um, work with her and appeared before her is really quite important. Um, and I know this is the same kind of review you have done for other justices, regardless of the political party of the president. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Um, one of the things that I um, brought up with her yesterday, and this, whatever that discussion you wouldn't have had to see, uh, was that um, of her over 500 opinions, I think nearly 600 op opinions, uh, she only had a 3% reversal rate. And in one case that she and I discussed um, involving Guam, uh, she actually wrote an opinion. Uh, the D.C. Circuit uh, reversed her, but then the U.S. Supreme Court uh, reversed the D.C. Circuit and sided with her unanimously, and Clarence Thomas wrote the opinion. I just think it's an interesting twist on if people have an agenda um, and also about a judge um, that is calling things as they are. And just in general, when it comes to reversal rates, is that something you look at? Um, would you be alarmed if she had a very high reversal rate um, as opposed to what we see here? Well, we uh, certainly so. look at reversal rates, and I think Mr. Drayton can comment on uh, the reaction of our reading groups who looked at specifically those cases as well and what their conclusions were. Well, first, Senator, the conclusions were that in the cases in which she was reversed, she was analyzing unquestioned uh, legal questions, unsettled legal questions, and thus they were questions of first impression. They, when they looked at her analysis in those cases, they found her analysis to be reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, and so they felt that she had to 
difficult questions of jurisdiction and statutory interpretation. And so they felt that her record was excellent given the fact that only less than 2% of her cases were reversed. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. Well, I want to just thank you for your good work. I read some of the uh, comments, which I will, I'm sure are in the record of some of the people that you interviewed. But I guess I'd end with that. Uh, she's one of the brightest legal minds in the country. Um, we have a lot of smart people, uh, but she is brilliant. Um, studying her opinions, this was my favorite, is like a master class in judicial writing. Um, and then finally, I think, which is very important uh, after our hearing yesterday, Judge Jackson has the perfect temperament for a judge. And with that, I will close. Thank you. Senator Blumenthal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't think anybody has ever said about us that we have the perfect temperament for a senator. <laughs> no That's comment. That's why I closed that way, yeah. Senator no, Blumenthal. No comment, Senator Blumenthal. <laughs> thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I, I want to, uh, first of all, thank you for the hours and hours and hours and the energy that you have put into this work and that the ABA does on its recommendation. I know how thoughtfully and carefully you review the, somebody's record, uh, but also to kind of sift through the different opinions that you encounter, uh, having been in the arena, as Senator Klobuchar says, uh, you know, it's an arena. It's an adversarial process. People go at each other in the courtroom and in litigation. And that can leave scars and animosities that sometimes are elicited when you do this kind of report. So what I find amazing here is that uh, nobody has a bad thing to say about Judge Jackson. Nobody says, you know, she was mean to me or she was disrespectful. Is that impression correct? That, that impression is definitely correct. And to put a little color on it, when we talk about prosecutors, Senator, and we talk about defense counsel, you know, many defense counsel are former prosecutors. When we talk about liberals and conservatives, they're defense counsel that are liberal and conservatives. And so when we speak to these attorneys, um, they have different perspectives. And it is surprising um, it, that unanimously the bar uh, appreciates Judge Jackson, sees that she has high competency, integrity, and temperament. And uh, Senator, again, we talked to lawyers and judges throughout the country, and what was remarkable was how consistent they were in their comments about how everyone gets a fair shake. I think that's really what comes through, that everybody gets a fair shake, that she listens so intently and carefully to everybody who comes into her courtroom, and that seems to be the hallmark of her professional career, that she listens well to people and assesses fairly the grievances and contentions that they may make. Um, let me ask you about this thing called judicial philosophy. Um, I don't think if I were to ask most judges, they would know how to answer the question of what's your judicial philosophy. You don't ask people to evaluate her judicial philosophy, do you? I mean, that seems kind of so amorphous uh, an issue you wouldn't be able to evaluate. Is that correct? That's correct. And for two reasons. Number one, in terms of what is a judicial philosophy, and then number two, how would we measure it? Instead, we focus on criteria that people do understand, and that is, does the nominee have the requisite integrity, professional competence, and judicial temperament? And uh, just a couple of uh, last questions. Uh, if you were given more time to do this assessment, it strikes me you've done it very, very thoroughly and carefully. Um, 
you feel you've been given enough time and you've had access to enough information and records, there's no question in your mind that there's something missing here that you would have wanted to see. There is no question in my mind that there's a subject that we missed. I feel very comfortable with the review we did. It was comprehensive. It was nonpartisan. It reached out to people and asked probing questions on the particular topics that we knew there had been allegations about, and none of them panned out. And instead, we got a consistent response that she met the criteria that more than satisfies our rating of well-qualified. I agree completely, Senator. And just to give you an idea, when the President mentioned that there, when, when Justice Breyer stepped down, our committee immediately went into action. We already had all the email addresses of all the judges, federal judges throughout the country. We were ready to just hit the button as soon as we knew who the nominee was. And so in my mind, there was nothing more we could have done. And we're absolutely convinced we've covered it. We cast a wide net for that very purpose. And we have circuit representatives that know the judges and lawyers and bar associations and law deans in their area. So the circuit representatives are comfortable, and those in their circuits are comfortable with them. And we're very confident we covered the landscape. I agree as well, Senator. I really appreciate your candor and the completeness of the work you've done. Thank you very much. Senator Ossoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Grassley. Uh, thank you all for your testimony today and, uh, and for your work. I, I take very seriously my constitutional obligations and responsibilities with respect to advice and consent uh, on behalf of my constituents in Georgia and want to just engage you and uh, interrogate the work that you've done and the conclusions that you've drawn. Uh, First of all, you, you are here under oath, correct? We are. Yes. Yes. And you conducted a, uh, a robust review of the nominee's professional record, correct? Yes. Right. Uh, you interviewed colleagues. You interviewed counsel uh, who had argued cases before her, correct? Yes. Right. Uh, you convened reading groups who undertook a comprehensive review of her published decisions. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Please, uh, Judge Williams, uh, what were your conclusions with respect to uh, the nominee's reputation for integrity? Outstanding, excellent, superior, superb. Those were the comments of virtually everyone we interviewed. And, and Judge, that is um, substantial praise. I want to just clarify, you're not here in an advocacy role or a partisan role, correct? No. No, we're not. We are doing peer review, which means we get all the information. That's our job, to get the information and then to relay that information to the Senate Judiciary Committee as it applies to the standards that we use to measure a, 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 a nominee. As the organization has undertaken such reviews of past nominees from nominated by presidents of both parties, correct? Correct. Um, Ms. Veda, if I might, what were your conclusions regarding Judge Jackson's professional competence based on this review? My conclusions are that she has the highest degree of professional competence and is admired by both the bench and bar with her, as a result of her keen intellect, her strong analytical skills, and the clarity and sophistication in her writing. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Drayton, you also undertook, as part of this review and analysis based on these interviews, based on the review of the nominee's record, uh, an assessment of her overall professional competence and qualifications, correct? Correct. And what were your conclusions? She's of the highest stature when it comes to professional competence. Thank you, Mr. Drayton. What were the conclusions of the reading groups, Judge Williams? Uh, that were convened to assess her decisional history. I will have, I'll have, let Mr. Drayton, Thank you, Mr. Drayton please. focus on that, but it, they, it was of the highest caliber. Correct. The reading groups found that her writing was impressive, 
Um, she was meticulous. She considered all arguments. She made a roadmap of her arguments that the lay person could understand. Um, they looked at her reversals and they found that she was reasonable. They found that she took sound legal positions um, in novel areas of law. They also looked at how she also had her record supported by the Supreme Court in one of her reversals. And so the reading group who are taught legal minds in the United States felt that she was a phenomenal writer and they thought that she was well qualified in their opinions based on her writings to be a part of the United States Supreme Court. Thank you, Mr. Drayton. And my final question, if we might just move down the bench, beginning with you, Ms. Veda, please. Did your organization encounter in the course of this review uh, any derogatory information, any testimony uh, that raised any serious questions about the nominee's integrity, qualifications, or impartiality? We did not. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Not, not a thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Ossoff. I'm going to recognize Senator Whitehouse for the few remaining moments of his time, and we're going to try to establish whether Senator Blackburn is available after him. Uh, if she could reach out to us and let us know, she may be contacting us virtually. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you. I believe I had a few minutes left, and if no other senator is seeking recognition, I'd like to ask Judge Williams. Uh, Judge Williams, are you familiar with the phrase asked and answered? Hmm. I am. Could you tell me under what circumstances the phrase asked and answered would come up in your courtroom? When a witness is asked a question and then continues to be asked the same question, there would be an objection by opposing counsel. And what is the And role? that objection would be sustained. So the role of the judge in that is to do what? The role of the judge is to monitor the trial to monitor the to 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 make sure the evidence that's coming in is properly admitted to make sure when I say administer it something like that asked and answered if we allowed counsel to just continue to ask the same questions over and over again we'd never conclude the trial so judges manage trials and that's part a critical role of a judge thanks your honor Thanks, Senator Whitehouse, and I want to thank the panel. Senator Blackburn's uh, informed us she's not going to be participating in, in this panel. Uh, and so we want to thank you for your service to the ABA, your testimony, your dedication to helping the American people better understand the qualifications and integrity of judicial nominees, including Judge Jackson. Thank you for joining us this Mr. morning. Mr. Chairman, Sorry. I, I could just, if I could just say in response to uh, Senator Whitehouse, we could only dream that our proceedings here in the legislative branch were as efficient, as orderly, and uh, relied upon uh, uh, non-hearsay uh, information like you did in your courtroom, Judge. So uh, thank you very much. Well, maybe, Senator, you need a judge here in the chamber. <laughs> we have one. <laughs> we, we have uh, re recovering judges here. <laughs> a retired Supreme Court justice. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to turn to our final panel, 10 outside witnesses, and we have to do a little bit of logistical work to be prepared for them. Thank you all. Now, these 10 witnesses are, are five called by the majority, five by the minority. And when they arrive, we're going to call on them alphabetically, alternating between majority and minority. I'm going to go through the list of witnesses. It appears that I'm going to... Well, first, I'll start with the majority witnesses. Representative Joyce Beatty, Ohio's 3rd Congressional District, serves as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. Great to see you, Congresswoman. Risa Galiboff, Galiboff, forgive me if I didn't pronounce it quite right, dean of the University of Virginia School of Law. Wade Henderson, president, CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Richard Rosenthal, a childhood friend of Judge Jackson, Captain, Captain Frederick Thomas, national president of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, also known as Noble. Minority witnesses include Attorney General Steve Marshall of Alabama. I 
I hope he's here. Professor Jennifer Mascott of George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School. Eleanor McCullen, petitioner in the case of McCullen versus Coakley. Keisha Russell, a counsel at First Liberty and Alessandro Serrano from Operation Underground Railroad. Oh, there they are. Before you all get comfortable, I'm going to swear you in. So if I ask each of you if able, please rise or raise your right hand. <clears throat> Do you affirm the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record reflect that all of the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. And so we're going to alternate between majority and minority and try to do this alphabetically. And the staff starts with Congresswoman Beatty. Be sure to punch the button so we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and members of the committee. I am Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, Chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, representative for Ohio's 3rd District, and a proud HBCU graduate. It is an honor to appear before you to express my strong and unwavering support for the nomination of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson to the Supreme Court of the United States. As the nation has learned during these hearings, Judge Jackson is an exceptionally qualified jurist of unimpeachable character. As chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, I speak on behalf of 59 members of Congress, including 28 black women and 31 black men, together representing 17 million black Americans and 82 million Americans. For over two centuries since our country's founding, the court consisted exclusively of white men. Of the 115 justices, 108 have been white men. Judge Jackson would be only the sixth woman and the first black woman to serve on our nation's highest court. If confirmed, she would shatter a glass ceiling that many Americans, including those who fought and died for voting rights, a more perfect union, and a just America, believe that they would never live to see it broken. As a black woman myself, I urge this body to remember that Judge Jackson's confirmation vote must not be isolated to her gender or to her race. Instead, I urge you to closely examine her credentials and her sterling judicial record. To me, they read like a storybook for a perfectly prepared jurist to sit on the nation's highest court. She is grounded in family values, love of God and country, and academic excellence. In my recent conversation with her, it became immediately clear why President Biden chose her. Her life experience, education, and reverence for the rule of law clearly demonstrate that she has been preparing for this moment her entire life. Senators this week quoted Dr. King, and as I am reminded to paraphrase, King said, give us the ballot so we could put judges on the bench who will do justice and love mercy. Judge Jackson will do exactly that. Sadly, but not surprisingly, Judge Jackson has been the subject of unfair tax. These bad faith efforts exist despite a resume that arguably surpasses those of previous nominees. I remind this body in America just last year, Judge Jackson was confirmed by this body on a bipartisan vote to serve on the D.C. Circuit Court and that she clerked for Justice Breyer, whose very seat she is being considered for. 
Judge Jackson's confirmation will send a message to black women and little girls like my granddaughter, Leah, whose mother is the first black woman to serve on the 10th District Court of Appeals. And Leah's first known president was a black man. And now she sees a black female vice president. So if a guidance counselor tells her your goals are too high, she will remember how Judge Jackson soared against adversity as one of our nation's brightest legal minds. I want to be crystal clear. Judge Jackson will be a judge that will serve all of America and all of America can be proud of. Watching Judge Jackson sit at this very table displaying poise, grace, courage, and brilliance no matter what was thrown at her. Reminds me of the sheroes whose shoulders she stands on. From Ida B. Wells to Rosa Parks to Constance Baker Motley, the first black woman to argue at the Supreme Court and the first black woman appointed to the federal judiciary. These heroic Americans and Judge Jackson remind me of this phrase. Senators, never limit yourself because of others' limited imagination. Never limit others because of your own limited imagination. Lastly, the Congressional Black Caucus, often called the conscience of the Congress, is calling on all senators to dig deep into their hearts and minds to unequivocally stamp out any unconscious or conscious bias or discrimination as this process moves forward. CBC stands with Judge Jackson to ensure that she will be treated with the dignity and respect she serves. Let's change America and confirm her with a bipartisan vote. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Appreciate your being here this morning. Now we have the Attorney General of the State of Alabama, General Steve Marshall. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Grassley, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to testify today. I'm Steve Marshall and I serve as the Attorney General for the State of Alabama. I am here today as a representative of a community of experienced and dedicated prosecutors who are gravely concerned about the direction our country is heading as it relates to law and order. This committee is likely well acquainted with the wave of lawlessness that has swept across our nation over the past few years, leading to a surge in crime, including a horrific spike in homicides unseen since the 1990s. This week presents an important opportunity to discuss the role that the judiciary plays in the criminal justice system and the effect judges' decisions have on public safety. Upon the President's announcement of Judge Jackson's nomination, one supporter, an executive director of an influential progressive group that supports defunding the police, pronounced, we're in a moment where there's been an active movement to reform our broken criminal justice system. This appointment signals the administration's commitment to pursuing criminal justice reform at the highest level. Though I strongly disagree with the assessment that our criminal justice system is broken, I share his observation that this appointment may well be intended by this administration to initiate a transformation of our criminal justice system, or as Judge Jackson has described it, a fundamental redesign of our system. And as we know from history, the United States Supreme Court can absolutely transform criminal justice for better or for worse. The Senate must now do its due diligence to ensure that the ideology of the anti-incarceration and anti-police movement, views that the Biden administration seemingly has increasingly embraced, is never permitted to make its way onto our Supreme Court. As detailed in my written testimony, criminal justice advocacy groups have repeatedly highlighted Judge Jackson as a jurist focused on serving the most vulnerable and giving a voice to the voiceless, referring also to the socioeconomic and racial status of the offender population as evidence of a bias and broken system, while overlooking the inconvenient reality that the race and socioeconomic status of a crime victim is often identical to his or her offenders. A 2018 report by the Bureau of Justice Statistics found that the offender was of the same race or ethnicity as the victim in 70% of violent offenses involving black victims and 62% of violent offenses involving white victims. That same report showed that the largest percentage of violent crime victims were from households with annual incomes of less than $25,000 annually. Another study on crime victims found that the overall risk of violent victimization is highest among persons who are younger, 
male, black, living in the poorest households, and living in urban areas. These voices matter too. And Judge Jackson's now infamous Law Review article gives me no assurance that she would give voice to the voiceless victims of sex crimes. In that note, she questioned the necessity of sex offender community notification requirements, a common sense public safety measure that this body passed with bipartisan support and that the public overwhelmingly approves. Remarkably, the word victim did not appear once in her analysis. Promoting the false creed that the American criminal justice system is unfair, a reference Judge Jackson herself used in the opening line of a 2020 opinion, undermines justice itself. It denigrates the rule of law. It impedes the ability of law enforcement to protect and serve. It impairs the duty of prosecutors to keep violent criminals behind bars. All of this subverts the safety of the public and is most detrimental to the very voices Judge Jackson claims to speak for. I've heard nothing this week to alleviate my fear that Judge Jackson believes that a fundamental redesign is needed in our criminal justice system and that she would be so inclined to use her position on the court to this end. For this reason, I respectfully oppose her nomination. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today and would ask that my written testimony be accepted for the record. <clears throat> Without objection, thank you, General Marshall. Dean Gallenboff. Thank you, Senators, for the opportunity to comment on the nomination of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, whom I've known personally and professionally since 1998, and whose career I have followed closely since that time. I've taught constitutional law and legal history for 20 years at the University of Virginia, and I've served as the Dean of the School of Law since 2016. Today, I'm speaking in my personal capacity, not my official capacity as Dean, and my testimony is not based on the views or positions of the University of Virginia. It is based rather on my personal views as a scholar, placing Judge Jackson in both a broad historical perspective and the context of contemporary thought on the judicial role. My conclusion is that the Supreme Court and the nation will benefit enormously from the keen intelligence, impeccable integrity, broad experience, and intellectual open-mindedness of a Justice Jackson. Before I turn to the main portion of my testimony, let me add my historian's brief reflection on the historic nature of this appointment. It was some 56 years ago that the Senate confirmed Constance Baker Motley, Judge Jackson's role model, to be the first black woman judge on any federal court. That Judge Jackson shares Judge Motley's birthday is, as has been said, a happy coincidence. That she shares her status as a trailblazer is far more than that. It is causal. She and we would not be here today without Judge Motley and others like her who paved the way. I have three main points. First, Judge Jackson is eminently qualified to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. To illustrate with just a few numbers, she holds two degrees with Latin honors from Harvard University. She has served as a law clerk to three federal judges nominated by presidents of two parties. She has been confirmed by bipartisan votes of the Senate three times to federal office. Altogether, she has accumulated 26 years of legal experience, seven in private practice, and 19 in public service, including two years as a federal public defender, six with the Bipartisan Sentencing Commission, and nine years as a judge on two federal courts. You know all this, but this abbreviated description both makes clear that Judge Jackson will bring enormous distinction to the Supreme Court and highlights how her varied experience will enrich both her own opinions as a justice and the collective deliberations of the court. That Judge Jackson has represented clients from well-resourced corporations to the indigent and unpopular is testament not only to her robust embrace of every lawyer's obligation to serve the public, but also to her commitment to the rule of law in an adversarial system in which every party is entitled and criminal defendants are constitutionally entitled to zealous advocacy. Her insights from the district court will especially enhance the Supreme Court's understanding of how trial courts implement their decisions. This brings me to my second point about the salutary judicial approach Judge Jackson has developed out of this varied experience. As a trial judge, she has shown deep respect for precedent. She has written about the importance of stare decisis, which informs her view of the judge's role in our constitutional scheme as simultaneously crucial and modest. Accordingly, her opinions are based on precedent and committed to the rule of law. They are fact-based and pragmatic, open-minded, and analytical. Among the more than 500 cases that Judge Jackson has decided, whether the matters at hand concerned environmental regulation or immigration law, criminal charges, employment discrimination, or business disputes, she has found in favor of both plaintiffs and defendants, for individuals, nonprofits, businesses, and the government. 
One simply cannot presume what Judge Jackson's ruling will be based on the party's political affiliations, positions in the world, or other characteristics. Rather, what remains constant across these hundreds of opinions is Judge Jackson's commitment to applying precedence to the facts before her, maintaining procedural consistency, reasoning with common sense and humanity, and doing justice for the parties consistent with the rule of law. These traits place Judge Jackson in the heartland and the mainstream of the American judicial tradition. My final point is personal as well as scholarly, about the connection between Judge Jackson and Justice Stephen Breyer, for whom she and I both clerked. Judge Jackson is very much her own judge, and her judicial approach stems from her own experience and the mainstream currents of judicial thought in the 21st century. That said, two similarities bear highlighting. First, Justice Breyer and Justice Jackson shared their deeply held patriotism, which they both absorbed from family members who dedicated their professional lives to public service. Judge Jackson believes as deeply as Justice Breyer in service to American values and in the value of the American Constitution. Moreover, Judge Jackson, like Justice Breyer, has always been as interested in hearing the views of others as in sharing her own. She has worked with lawyers from across the political spectrum and found consensus with her colleagues on the Sentencing Commission and the DC Circuit. After Justice Breyer announced his retirement, I reflected, as I think many of his clerks did, that the lessons he taught me are ones I rely on every day. The appetite for dialogue, optimism, open-minded and open-heartedness, and joy. I hoped then that they would remain with the court and the nation long after his retirement. If you confirm Judge Jackson, as I urge you to do, those virtues, both personal and judicial, will indeed with, remain with the court, much to the benefit of us all. Thank you. Thanks, Dean Gelloff. The next uh, person to testify is Professor Mascot, Jennifer Mascot of George Mason University, Anton Scalia Law School. Professor. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. It's an honor to appear before this committee to discuss this nomination. As the hearings have so far demonstrated, Judge Jackson has a wealth of experience and is very well respected. I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate in this body's serious and substantial consideration of a nomination to serve on the nation's highest court. My testimony will focus on the constitutional doctrines applicable to the role of the court within our constitutional system and on judicial philosophy. As its preamble states, the Constitution was ordained by the people to establish justice and form a more perfect union. And the nomination process under consideration today in many ways demonstrates the success of that effort. The Constitution's text and structure include two critical framework protections for liberty. Federalism, the division of power between states and the federal government with significant freedom retained by the people and their critical institutions like the family and religious bodies, and the horizontal separation of federal power across three distinct branches. The Federalist structure is perhaps the primary protection of the two in that it lays the foundational threshold groundwork for the enumerated limited nature of the powers that any branch of the federal government may exercise. The Constitution does not empower the federal government to enact just any law in any form. Rather, Article I sets forth limited enumerated powers vesting only those legislative powers herein granted in that article to the policymaking body of the U.S. Congress. The constitutional structure also intentionally makes federal action difficult and cumbersome, serving as a break on the federal government its ability to regulate people even within its enumerated areas of authority. One's interpretation of the proper role of these structural safeguards is a critical component of one's understanding of the role of each of the three federal branches and is critical to shaping judicial philosophy. The component of federal power, of course, front and center today is the vesting of judicial power. That authority under Article III extends only to the power to resolve cases arising under the Constitution, federal laws and treaties under them, and certain categories of controversies. As the discussion during this hearing demonstrates, that power constrains a judge to application of the text and rule of law, not shifting policy preferences, cultural norms, or extensions emanating from governing text. The Article III limited authorization to resolve concrete cases and disputes ensures that the Article III judge is not charged with general responsibility to decide questions of national policy or the power to offer advisory opinions on legal questions. And particularly when deciding cases arising under federal laws and the Constitution, the Article III judge must faithfully interpret and apply the text. And the limited power to decide cases and controversies also suggests caution in the imposition of remedies. Um, an Article III nominee's judicial philosophy should reflect deep awareness 
of these limitations. As a number of Supreme Court nominees before this body have previously testified, the interpretive philosophies most consistent with the constitutional role of a judge are originalism and textualism. Those methodologies generally understood essentially seek to identify the ordinary meaning of the relevant legal text at the time that it became governing law. Originalism is applied through the identification of original public meaning at the time of ratification is consistent with constitutional provisions such as Article 7 providing that the Constitution will become governing law as of its ratification by the conventions of nine states. Judges must take a constitutionally required oath to be bound by this Constitution and the laws of the United States made in pursuance thereof, and it's the text of those laws that have supreme effect. Finally, the Constitution provides for a finely grained amendment process with substantially challenging procedural hurdles. This process can not be overcome by jurists developing sense of cultural norms apart from constitutional text. Original public meanings commitment to identifying the meaning of constitutional or amendment text at the time it's given effect is consistent with these principles. And the statutory interpretive methodology of textualism similarly, similarly maintains consistency with these constraints. Just as Article 7 procedures give authority to the constitutional text, Article 1, Section 7 procedures indicate that statutes have governing effect once they're enacted by Congress and the President. Therefore, the text of those enacted laws, the public understood text is at the time of its enactment governs the proper interpretation of these laws. In testimony and statements, Judge Jackson, like prior nominees representing a range of views and jurisprudential approaches, has articulated general support for originalism and textualism, but commitment to these methodologies hinges on their application and practice. When asked about judicial philosophy, Judge Jackson has declined to identify express commitment to a particular philosophy, instead focusing on a multi-step interpretive method, highlighting the steps she takes in deciding cases such as looking at briefs, the factual record, congressional intent, purpose, and precedent. It's challenging to definitively discern or predict a juror's future methodological approach in the Supreme Court on the basis of service on a federal district court, but hesitance to commit to a particular judicial philosophy could leave flexibility for incorporation of various interpretive approaches during Supreme Court service, and Judge Jackson's explanation of her interpretive methodology during the hearing suggests perhaps more reliance on legislative history and extra textual sources and purpose than that used by textually committed jurists like the late Justice Scalia, Justice Thomas, and more recent nominees like Justices Barrett, Kavanaugh, and Gorsuch. In addition, some of Justice Jackson or Judge Jackson's prior body of work suggests that she um, also may have a different uh, view than a traditionally applied methods of originalism. Um, in the recent decision uh, involving a conflict between the Congress and the executive branch, Judge Jackson inferred an implied cause of action from the Constitution, a, a determination that was later reversed by the D.C. Circuit, finding that uh, inference of an applied cause of action outside the judicial role. This body is appropriately weighing constitutional principles, the role of the Senate and the federal judiciary and interpretive philosophy and its consideration of nominees. The interpretation of law consistent with originalism and textualism as traditionally applied is important to maintain limits on governmental power and to preserve liberty. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Professor Mascott. Next is Wade Henderson, President and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Welcome back. Thank you. Henderson. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and members of the committee. I'm Wade Henderson, Interim President and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, a national coalition of more than 230 organizations dedicated to building an America as good as its ideals. Thank you for inviting me to share our coalition's strong support for the confirmation of Judge Katanji Brown-Jackson as an Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. By any standard, she is an exceptionally qualified nominee. When confirmed, Judge Jackson will make history as the first black woman to serve on the Supreme Court, and it will happen 55 years after civil rights lawyer Thurgood Marshall was confirmed as the nation's first black Supreme Court justice. We have waited far too long for this day, but we are nonetheless overjoyed that it has finally arrived. Judge Jackson's presence on the court will matter tremendously. We know that a more racially diverse court includes the perspectives of communities who have been traditionally excluded from seats of power, and that judges from different demographic and legal backgrounds infuse more viewpoints into their deliberations. Importantly, a diverse court helps communities trust that judicial decisions are not biased in favor of a select few. As you've heard this week, Judge Jackson will also be the first former public defender on the court and the first justice 
with any significant criminal defense experience since Justice Marshall. This is vital. Public defenders play a critical role in our criminal legal system, protecting the constitutional rights of people who cannot afford lawyers. But they remain vastly underrepresented on the federal bench. Institutions that we entrust to safeguard our democracy, including the Supreme Court, must work for everyone. It is imperative for the federal judiciary to be made up of fair-minded judges and justices who are committed to civil and human rights of all and who reflect diverse experiences. Our communities depend on the federal courts to administer justice and, importantly, to recognize injustice from the perspective of many. Judge Jackson, who has a commitment to defending the constitutional rights of all, is exactly who we need on the Supreme Court. As a district court and circuit court judge, Judge Jackson has demonstrated her even-handed approach to the law. Her record is immense, and while we may not always agree with her decisions, her commitment to follow the law and the measured ways in which she has approached the law has been remarkable. Judge Jackson's impressive record on and off the bench demonstrates that she is a fair-minded arbiter of justice. And it is why the civil and human rights community has so strongly endorsed her. Last week, the Leadership Conference sent a letter to senators signed by nearly 200 national organizations calling for her confirmation. We know that her distinguished legal career, her collegiality to all she encounters, her remarkable judicial temperament, and her demonstrated commitment to equal justice make her the perfect choice. Fifty-seven years ago tomorrow, Dr. King and thousands of foot soldiers arrived in Montgomery, Alabama, after marching from Selma in their quest for voting rights. Decades later, this historic moment represents yet another step on our nation's long march toward a more inclusive democracy. As Dr. King said that day, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Today, we must all recognize that Judge Jackson's confirmation to the Supreme Court will bend that arc a little more. All of us who are impacted by the decisions of the court can be confident that Justice Jackson will continue to do her part to keep the sacred promise of our courts and our country. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. And uh, the order is a little different here, I'm told. The next witness is Mrs. Eleanor McCullen. Mrs. McCullen. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Grassley, and members of this wonderful committee, my name is Eleanor McCullen, and I am honored to be with you today as you consider the nomination of Judge Jackson to the Supreme Court. I also would like to say I am grateful for all of your service to our country. I have dedicated my life in service to empowering women as a sidewalk counselor. I was also the lead plaintiff in an important free speech case, McCullen versus Coakley. Today, I would like to touch on two topics that are very near and dear to my heart. The first, the importance of empowering and supporting pregnant women who feel alone and without options. Two, the importance of confirming judges committed to preserving one of Americans' most cherished freedoms, the freedom of speech. For over 20 years, I have served as a sidewall counselor, and I offer hope, help, and love to the Boston women and their families. So many women I've met believe that their only choice is to end the life of their baby. It is in that moment of isolation and fear that I have the privilege of offering a different choice one that empowers and encourages the woman to know she is fully capable of becoming a mom and pursuing a job and going to school 
and having a successful and happy life. When I see a woman approaching, coming down Commonwealth Avenue, I always say, good morning, I'm Eleanor. How can I help you? It's a powerful moment when a woman looks at me and our eyes connect and she stops to talk. It's in that moment, I promise her, she will never walk her journey alone. Of course, women often share with me their fears and their concerns about their pregnancy. I honor their thoughts and concerns, and I say, I understand, that is a challenge. But I also know you can do it with support, and I will support you with all my kinds of support. I will stand with you throughout the nine months and beyond. I will hold your hand. I'm able to provide the mothers whatever resources they might need in that moment, including medical care, financial support. Of course, they come to our house. Of course, baby clothes and bassinets. I've had many, 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 many baby showers. Of course, if some of my mothers want to go to school, we're able to help them financially to go back to school. And I just stick with the mothers and their families for as long as they need my help. For me, it's a joy to be able to offer women love and kindness, no matter what time of night or day they might call and need me. And being able to watch the children grow up, children who wouldn't be here had the mother not stopped to talk to me, this is an incredible privilege. In the midst of this joy, however, I know firsthand the pain of being unable to serve women when the government tries to violate our right to free speech. In 2007, Massachusetts enacted a buffer zone. It was a law prohibiting pro-life speakers from coming within 35 feet of the entrance of an abortion facility. As you might imagine, this prevented us from being compassionate and serving women and their babies because the law prevented us from having quiet, intimate conversations with them. I quickly realized that if I wanted to continue supporting women and babies, I, as a sidewalk counselor, I had to challenge the law. Even though I never thought I'd be part of a lawsuit, I knew I couldn't compromise or allow Massachusetts to rob Americans of our constitutional freedoms. So I stood for women. I stood for the babies and for every American's right to free speech, regardless of their views on life and abortion. I was deeply saddened to find out that Judge Jackson, while in private practice, advocated in favor of Massachusetts' previous buffer zone law in her amicus brief on behalf of abortion clinics. She and her colleagues maligned pro-life counselors characterizing us in ugly and false ways. Her misrepresentations certainly don't describe me or any of the sidewall counselors that I have worked with over the years. Indeed, the entire reason I challenged the buffer zone law was because I did not want to shout from a distance or come across as a woman with no compassion. Thankfully, in 2014, all nine justices of the Supreme Court ruled that Massachusetts buffer zone did violate the First Amendment. When a woman is alone, sidewalk counselors walk with her in that moment. When a child is just minutes from losing his or her life, sidewalk counselors serve as their voice. The unborn have no voice. As Americans, we will disagree on many important issues, but that's the beauty of why our Constitution protects free speech and allows each of us to speak truth with love. My hope is that this precious freedom 
which preserves our nation from tyranny and violence will remain respected and upheld. I would ask Judge Jackson that if she is confirmed to the Supreme Court, that she will choose to uphold all Americans' First Amendment freedoms. And I would like to end with a story. It just happened this week. I was home, and the telephone rang. And the woman said, Eleanor? I said, yes. She said, oh, I'm so glad to talk with you. She said, I was just looking through my baby book of my little three-month-old little girl. And underneath the picture of the baby was my card, my card that I give out, Hope, Help, and Love. And she had pasted that in the album underneath the baby picture. There was my card and my number. And she called me. And she said, I have to tell you. She said, Rose is now 18. She's graduating from high school. She's on her way to college. And I want to thank you for being there that day in January. And you talked to me. And I have to tell you, Rose is the joy of our life. So in conclusion, you might ask, why am I so passionate about supporting mothers and free speech? Well, it's called love. And love, you can't argue with that. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Ms. McCullough, for being here today. We really appreciate that. You're welcome. Our next witness is Mr. Richard Rosenthal. Mr. Chairman, ranking member, members of the Judiciary Committee, thank you for the distinct honor of appearing before you today. Just a few weeks from now, I will marry my beloved fiance, Anna. And today, I get to testify in support of the nomination of my lifelong friend, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, to be on the Supreme Court. So I feel especially blessed these days. And get well soon, Dad, I love you. Senators, I have known Ketanji Brown Jackson for nearly 38 years. We first met in 1984 as students in our public junior high school in Miami, Florida. I was 12 years old back then and Ketanji was 14. We were friends back then right away. And now 38 years later, we still remain dear friends. From the very first day I met Ketanji, I knew she was special. In my entire life, I have never met anyone like her. In junior high, and then again at our large public high school, Ketanji was seemingly everywhere and everything. The president of the student body, the upbeat voice delivering the morning announcements over the school's public address system, the graduating senior voted most likely to succeed. And in our speech and debate program, she was literally the national champion in her event. Through it all, she was the one student who stood out as universally loved and admired by everyone, her fellow students, teachers, and administrators alike. Katanji's incandescent brilliance was obvious to all of us from day one. But even more importantly, she has always been one of the kindest, warmest, most humble and down-to-earth people I have ever met. All this while still possessing boundless charisma, drive, maturity, and grace. For all these remarkable characteristics to somehow reside in the same one person, well, I suppose you can understand why everyone who knows Katanji believed she was destined for greatness. I could go on and on describing Katanji's amazing qualities, but instead, let me relate two stories from our high school days. First, Katanji wasn't just a supernova national champion from our debate squad, though of course she was. She was also the unofficial leader of our tight-knit debate family, acting basically as a student coach and mentor for all the younger students. Outside in the grassy area between the school's hallways, we would sit cross-legged on the ground, all of us in rapt attention, while Katanji would stand and explain to us the keys to success, in particular, the need for preparation, poise, discipline, and above all, hard work. She was a born leader. No matter how high she would climb, she, would, she always threw ladders down to the rest of us and encouraged us and helped us on our upward climb to the best of our abilities. In 1998, for just a few weeks, Katanji's path and my path overlapped again as we both served as law clerks for judges on the same court, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. 
She was finishing up her one-year appellate clerkship and I was just beginning mine. For those few weeks, I confess that I felt a surge of excitement and satisfaction because I had actually accomplished something that Katanji had accomplished. But for her part, Katanji has never been about comparing herself to anybody else's accomplishments. She simply sets her own goals and then works tirelessly to achieve them. In the nearly 40 years that I've known Katanji, I can't remember ever hearing her say an unkind word to anybody or even an unkind word about anybody. That's just not her nature. And it's not how her amazing parents, Mr. Brown and Mrs. Brown, raised her. That leads me to my second story about high school. It was the fall of 1987. I was a sophomore and Katanji was a senior. In our Latin American history class, I sat in the seat next to hers. But on this particular day, her chair was empty. The, but just then, the school principal came on the PA system and announced that a handful of our senior class had been accepted to Harvard College that day, a huge achievement for our large and often underfunded public high school. As fate would have it, at that very moment that the principal announced Katanji's name, Katanji happened to open the door and walk in the classroom. The entire classroom immediately leapt to its feet, exploded in applause, and ran over to Katanji to embrace her. It was one of the most genuine, heartwarming moments I have ever seen. Every student was so happy for Katanji and so proud of her accomplishment. Nobody was jealous, nobody was resentful, and nobody was at all surprised because she was Katanji. And now, some four decades later, the President of the United States has nominated Katanji to be a Supreme Court Justice. It seems fitting. After all, this is what great Americans are supposed to do. They're supposed to achieve great things. And Katanji Brown Jackson is a great American. Personally, I feel blessed to have been born in a country that can produce such an extraordinary person. My parents of blessed memory were Jews who escaped persecution in Nazi Germany. And they, along with my dear parents, always reiterated to me and my siblings what an amazing country this is, because in America, anybody can succeed, no matter who they are, what they look like, or where they come from. My grandparents and my parents were right. In America, a great person like the Honorable Ketanji Brown Jackson can indeed succeed and can ascend to positions of great trust and great responsibility. Members of the Senate, by confirming this extraordinary woman to a seat on the Supreme Court, you will honor everything that is good and right about America. For the good of our country and for the good in our country, I hope that you will. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Uh, Ms. Keisha Russell. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. I am a constitutional lawyer at First Liberty Institute. First Liberty is a national legal organization with a mission to defend and restore religious liberty for all Americans. In addition to being a lawyer, I'm also the daughter of Jamaican-born parents, and I'm a former elementary school teacher in Atlanta Public Schools. I'm here to explain how critical race theory may impact a judge's judicial philosophy, including the fulfillment of her oath to uphold the Constitution, as well as to remain impartial and uphold the integrity and independence of the judiciary. Critical race theory, or CRT, is a subset of critical theory that began with Immanuel Kant in the 1790s. Critical theory rejected the principles of the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason, on which the American Republic was founded. Critical theory teaches that all human relationships are relationships of power between the oppressors and the oppressed. The oppressor-oppressed lens of critical theory helped, helped establish totalitarian ideologies, such as Marxism and Nazism. CRT's key assertion is that racism is not the result of individual conscious prejudices, actions, or thoughts, but rather that racism is a, is a systemic and structural force. CRT teaches that racism is embedded in America's legal systems, institutions, and capitalist economy, and it demands whiteness as a societal norm. I will address three of CRT's erroneous assumptions and the possible impact on judicial philosophy. Number one, believing that America was founded on racist ideals is wrong and incompatible with a judge's oath to uphold the Constitution. CRT proponents claim that America was founded and the Constitution was drafted to promote racism and slavery. His historians have debunked this claim as false. The truth is that America's founders were divided on this issue of slavery, and many of the founders were abolitionists. America's core ideals of freedom and equality, expressed in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, sparked the movements that led to the eventual elimination of both slavery and Jim Crow. CRT is sometimes erroneously analyzed analogized to the civil rights movement, and some CRT proponents even assert that Dr. King was a critical race theorist, but he was not. 
Now, King would argue that Bull Connor, the head of the Birmingham, Alabama police and the Southern racists were violating the principles of the American founding. But critical race theory would argue the opposite, that Connor was the fulfillment of the, of the American founding because America was founded to perpetuate this white supremacy. Ultimately, we cannot expect someone who subscribes to critical race theory to defend and protect the Constitution because CRT asserts that the Constitution is not worth defending. Such a view completely contradicts the oath every judge takes. Number two, a judge who embraces critical race theory <clears throat> perspective that America must address racism by encouraging racism cannot be an impartial judge. Contrary to CRT's assertion that racism is socially created, racism is the result of individual feelings of superiority and prejudice. There's no doubt that bad laws will further a racist society, but such racism must first be alive in the individual before it can become alive in society. Ultimately, when unaddressed prejudice gets married to power, there is going to be an unintended pregnancy, which will give birth to the evil of racism. Since personal prejudices advance a racist society, we cannot address racism by encouraging racist behaviors. Mr. Kendi, one of CRT's advocates, brazenly declares that the only remedy to prevent discrimination is future discrimination. In essence, CRT proposes that the oppressed group must be granted advantages in society to the detriment of the oppressor group in order to address past injustices. Adherence to CRT removes the principle of equality before the law that is necessary for just decision making. Consider, for example, how a CRT philosophy could influence a judge's view in criminal sentencing. If a judge believes that the only way to correct racism is to provide advantages to blacks and disadvantages to whites, this would create dire injustices in that judge's practices. A judge who embraces CRT's views may engage in favoritism and partiality, contrary to the judicial canons. Number three, a judge must uphold the integrity and independence of the judiciary, and she cannot do so if she considers systemic racism in her decision making. While racism is alive in the hearts of many people in our country, it does not determine the outcome of any minority's educational, professional, or economic accomplishments. My own testimony is a reflection of this truth, as I am a first-generation American and the daughter of Jamaican-born parents, and despite the fact that my parents came to this country to build a life for themselves from the ground up, my parents still raised many successful children. And CRT does not acknowledge that regardless of the struggles that people face in life, we are all individually responsible for the lives we live and the success we attain. Instead, CRT makes race the predominant relevant factor. Every lawyer and judge promises defend and protect the U.S. Constitution. But we, she cannot uphold this oath if she believes that the Constitution and the principles of America's founding are inherently racist and inherently flawed. Neither can a judge remain impartial and administer judges independently if she holds a philosophy that correcting racism requires affording privileged classes less just, justice than oppressed classes. Ultimately, a judge should consider America's history as a lesson and a blueprint for why and how we must constantly seek to uphold and protect America's founding promises. For these reasons, First Liberty opposes the nomination. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Ms. Russell. And next is Captain Frederick Thomas. Good morning, Committee Chairman Senator Richard J. Durbin and Ranking Member Senator Charles E. Grassley and members of the U.S. Senate Committee on the Judiciary. I bring you greetings on behalf of the Executive Board, members, and constituents of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, Noble. My name is Frederick L. Thomas, and I am the National President of Noble and current Captain for the East Baton Rouge Parish Sheriff Office in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I have served more than 30 years in law enforcement profession and 26 years in the Louisiana Army National Guard. I am a U.S. military combat veteran who served in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. The organization I represent is noble, and the mission is to ensure equity in the administration of justice in the provision of public service to all communities and to serve as a conscience of law enforcement by being committed to justice by action Noble has approximately 50 chapters and represents over 3,400 members worldwide that consists of chief, executive officer, and command level law enforcement officials from federal, state, country, county, municipal law enforcement agencies, and criminal justice practitioners. It is an honor for Noble to provide written testimony on the nomination of Kachanji Brown Jackson to be associate justice of Supreme Court of the United States. We endorse President Joe Biden's nomination of the Federal Appeals Court Judge Katanji Brown Jackson 
to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court. A graduate of Harvard Law School, Judge Jackson brings a long and impressive resume, including her background in public service, experience as a federal public defender, and a federal judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. Throughout her career, Judge Jackson has demonstrated deep knowledge and respect for law, balanced judgment, and unwavering commitment to justice. She is intimately qualified to serve on the highest court in the land. Nova joins the International Association of Chiefs of Police, Fraternal Order Police, the more than 60 top law enforcement leaders, and former Republicans and Democrat Attorney Generals endorsing Judge Jackson. She has a unique perspective on the needs of law enforcement through, through the association of her family members in the profession. Judge Jackson has two uncles who were career law enforcement officers. One was the detective for the Miami-Dade County and the other road to the rank of become chief of police for Miami Police Department. In addition, her brother served as an undercover officer in a drug sting unit in Baltimore after graduating from college. It is our opinion that the direct familiarization with the complexity, challenges, and opportunity within law enforcement provides perspective on criminal justice issues that can be assessed to the Supreme Court. In evaluating her judicial track record, it is the opinion of NOVA and other law enforcement organizations that Judge Brown has cons constantly adjudicated based on the facts and applied the law fairly. Katunji Brown Jackson had been previously vetted twice by the Judiciary Committee and twice confirmed by the full Senate as a judge, garnering bipartisan support as recently as 2021. She was also confirmed in 2010 as the vice chair of the U.S. Sentencing Commission. It is noble hope that Katunji Brown Jackson will receive the bipartisan support for the most prestigious nomination to the nation's highest court. In closing, this is a watershed moment in our nation's history. Judge Katani J Brown Jackson is a stellar nominee with an extraordinary background. She is clearly qualified and possesses the knowledge, legal acumen, and experience to serve on the United States Supreme Court. Noble is honored to endorse a nominee of this stature who is confirmed with participating in deciding biblical legal cases impacting the lives of all people across this mosaic of our country. We encourage this esteemed body to send our nomination to the Senate floor. I thank you, Chair and Dorbin, for the invitation to appear today and the committee members for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President Thomas. Our last witness is Ms. Serrano, who I believe is going to join us by virtual WebEx. Let's hope that it's connected. Ms. Serrano. Good morning, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and members of the committee. Nelson Mandela once said, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way it treats its children. The people who sexually exploit and abuse children must be held accountable, not only to society, but to their victims. Incarceration and sex offender registration are ways to hold these criminals accountable and responsible for their despicable acts. Child pornography, or child sexual abuse material, or CSAM, is a horrific crime that plagues victims long after the initial sex sexual abuse. My name is Alessandra Parisi Serrano. I work for Operation Underground Railroad a nonprofit organization that partners with governments here and around the world to help victims of human trafficking and child exploitation get the necessary aftercare and support they so desperately need. Operation Underground Railroad also helps train foreign law enforcement and other entities who may have contact with potential victims on how to identify, investigate, and prosecute traffickers and exploiters of children. I recently joined this organization in December of 2021. For the pre preceding 18 plus years, I served as a federal prosecutor for the U.S. Department of Justice. During my DOJ career, I personally handled hundreds of child exploitation and human trafficking cases involving thousands of victims. I saw firsthand not only what these victims endured from the initial abuse, but also the continued abuse and exploitation for years to come. 
oftentimes for the remainder of their lives. The Supreme Court in the Paroline case recognized this fact when it allowed victims depicted in CSAM material to obtain mandatory restitution from voyeurs, distributors, and transporters of CSAM long after the initial sexual abuse has occurred. While the initial sexual abuse causes great harm from which victims never may never overcome, CSAM re-traumatizes victims for years after their abuse. Every time a person views CSAM, that child is re-exploited, re-traumatized, and re-abused. When an offender is caught viewing, downloading, or distributing these horrific images, mandatory notice goes to these victims that yet another offender viewed CSAM. Upon receiving these notices, victims are forced to relive the crime. Persons who download, view, and distribute CSAM cause an increase in the production of CSAM images. No one wants to see reruns of TV or movies. We've all experienced this during COVID when the release of new movies and TV shows stopped. And that includes voyeurs and distributors of CSAM. With this appetite for new material comes the increased demand for the abuse of younger kids in more violent, sadistic, and masochistic images, according to, re according to recent statistics. I personally prosecuted cases with images of abuse and exploitation of children as young as premature infants. This trend by certain judges to routinely decrease sentences far below the advisory sentencing guidelines and prosecutors' recommendations for CSAM consumers minimizes the gravity of the offense. While the amount of material being produced and number of people consuming this material has increased exponentially over recent years, the sentences have decreased. This makes no sense. I live in Southern California, where destructive wildfires are a yearly issue. The fires leave hundreds of victims in its wake. When the fires spread and get bigger, do we put fewer firefighters on the front line, use less water or resources, fewer containment measures? No, of course not. That scenario is akin to reducing, routinely reducing sentences for CSAM consumers when the supply is undisputedly increasing. I say again, it makes no sense. I hope all of the members of this committee agree that there is no cause more noble than protecting our children. Whether some crimes warrant longer prison sentences is a debate left for another day. However, purveyors of CSAM especially those with prior conduct involving sexual abuse or exploitation, deserve to be taken out of society for a substantial <clears throat> period of time and to be identified by the public through sex offender registries. It has been my experience that offender, offenders are only remorseful because they get caught and not because of what their deviant and destructive conduct has done to countless victims, many of whom are unidentified. Lastly, the notion that CSAM crimes only involves pictures is appalling to most prosecutors and victim advocates. CSAM depicts real children who deserve justice. These victims or survivors deserve our respect and dignity for what they endured. They do not deserve to be treated with less consideration than offenders who take sexual pleasure in viewing CSAM of what is the darkest days of their lives. Our society is better than that. At least I hope it is. Our most precious resource, our children, deserve it. On behalf of victims of CSAM and other sexual exploitation, I thank you for the committee's time and attention to this important matter. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Serrano. Uh, we're now going to have rounds of questions. There are five minutes. Five minutes, and I hope the members will hold to that standard. Uh, I'll begin. Uh, and let me start with Captain Thomas. Thanks. Thanks for coming here. Thanks for more than 30 years of uh, service in law enforcement. Thanks for more than 26 years of military service, including combat duty. Uh, it's an honor to have you as a panelist here, as it is with all of our panelists, but certainly I wanted to commend you for those things. Thank you, sir. You're probably aware of the fact that uh, Judge Jackson has received the unqualified endorsement, not only of your organization, Noble, but also of the Fraternal Order of Police and the International Association of Chiefs of Police, in addition to other law enforcement officials. Are you aware of that? Yes, sir. So there have been charges made uh, yesterday, day before, even this morning, that she is somehow part of a, quote, anti-incarceration, anti-police movement, that somehow she is affiliated with a defund the police movement. 
Would you or your organization have endorsed her if that were true? Sir, that would never happen if we knew that if she'd have made a statement like that. We never saw that in our research. That never came out. And I don't really think it's true, sir. I don't either. And I would assume the same thing is uh, the case for the Fraternal Order of Police, the largest uh, organization representing rank and file policemen in America, and the International Association of Chiefs of Police, respected at their own level for uh, the leadership they bring to law enforcement. So that is a charge which uh, I think is belied by the fact that this endorsement has taken place. Yes, sir. Wade Henderson, you were in the audience. Welcome back. You were in the audience and heard the earlier testimony from the American Bar Association. Two or three, maybe four members have really dwelled on this whole question of sentencing in child uh, in pornography cases and child abuse cases. And I asked the three representatives of the American Bar Association if they had made inquiry among the professionals prosecutors, defense lawyers, judges, who have witnessed Judge Jackson's role in criminal justice, particularly in this particular area of the law. And they testified that they had uh, consulted with 250 professionals to reach their conclusion of giving her a unanimously well-qualified rating. And I asked them during the course of this, since we spent so much time here with three or four members dwelling on that issue, whether they found any evidence to back up the charges that were being leveled at this committee level, and their answer was no, no evidence, not at all. You would think that one person out of 250 would have found the same conclusions as three or four of my colleagues did in the last several days. What is your conclusion from that? Mr. Chairman, your questions uh, to the American Bar Association representatives, in my view, were dispositive of this issue of whether Judge Jackson, in some way, was outside of the legal mainstream of other ju uh, jurists or somehow tolerated uh, the abuse of children implicitly by the questions that were posed. I thought their responses this morning were completely dispositive. I began, when I saw the testimony yesterday, thinking that, unfortunately, uh, this hearing has devolved in some ways to a partisan attack on an otherwise extraordinarily well-qualified nominee. By any standard, Judge Jackson's record, uh, both on and off the bench, her academic achievements are unparalleled with almost anyone who has been appointed uh, to the Supreme Court. A failure to find her vulnerable on the basis of qualification has somehow led to a series of questions focused on seven uh, uh, decisions that she rendered in sentencing that, in my view, bordered on the demagogic. I think when one takes a look at the repeated uh, effort to uh, pose questions about uh, her record somehow being outside of the mainstream, indeed reinforced that view. Ultimately, I think uh, the uh, issue, as uh, Senator Whitehouse uh, mentioned, was both asked and answered and that the judge had clearly demonstrated uh, that she was well within uh, the mainstream of judicial thinking. Finally, I felt that the criticism of some directed at her for her decision making was misplaced to the extent that uh, her uh, decisions, at least to those who questioned her, were somehow at variance with what uh, the law uh, was. They could have said that. No one did. But they could also recognize that it is up to Congress to establish the standards that judges apply in their decision-making responsibility. To the extent that there were questions posed about her, better to look inward at the role that Congress played in establishing the role that judges uh, fulfilled in this moment. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Senator Grassley. Ms. Mascott, uh, we heard several times from Judge Jackson that her judicial philosophy is in her 500 cases or whatever number that we have from her district court work. How, and then, uh, so that was her answer to the questions about what's your judicial philosophy. How important is a justice's judicial philosophy in determining how they will rule on the bench? Sure, Senator. Well, I think 
as these hearings and numerous Supreme Court uh, nomination proceedings previously have indicated, is judicial philosophy is obviously paramount because um, in contrast to the political branches, this body and the presidency, um, judges have a limited role to decide cases and controversies. Uh, it, it, and as Mr. Henderson is saying, Congress has a large role in establishing what the, what the role in the jurisdiction of courts uh, are going to be and the procedures they're going to put into place. And so a judge's uh, approach and philosophy in interpreting both the Constitution and statutory text is, is critical. And um, in the past, I think nominees that have gone on to serve on the Supreme Court and be uh, committed and, and consistent and exclusive in their adoption of originalism and textualism have um, clearly uh, discussed those methodologies, those philosophies, um, expressed commitment to them before this body and articulated their grounding in the Constitution. Uh, I'm going to ask Ms. Serrano, uh, you've, you're a former assi assistant U.S. attorney. You're familiar with yes. these crimes where children are victims. Could you describe yes, the sentencing enhancement around child pornography cases for use of computer, the number of images or pre uh victims, but not so much on the mechanics of it, but explain why we have these enhancements. It's my understanding that the enhancements were uh, created to recognize the aggravation that the use of a computer or somebody with more images versus less images or someone with images of very, very young children, they would deserve a higher sentence than somebody who was not uh, had those um, characteristics with their offense. Uh, could you explain uh, why possession of child pornography is not a victimless uh, crime? Yes, sir. So as I said in my testimony, these pictures or videos are real children. They're somebody's kid. They have parents. They have grandparents. They may have siblings. These are real children. And every time somebody views it, downloads it, possesses it, transports it, re-victimizes them, uh, can you imagine your most embarrassing moments on the internet forever? And this is not just embarrassing. This is this is brutal, uh, sometimes often very violent, um, horrible um, conduct that victims know that somebody is out there looking at it. Uh, Mr. Marshall, based upon your experience, which communities would be hurt most by anti-police movement? And is there anything in Judge Jackson's record specifically that concern you about her jur jurisprudence? Appreciate the question. You, as I raised in my opening statement, what gets lost when we describe the victims of crime is particularly where those victims are located. And those that advocate in anti-police and anti-incarceration statements are advocating directly against those that they claim to be able to speak for. You know, when I hear that uh, Justice Jackson would be a voice for the vulnerable, very rarely do I hear that being described to those victims of violent crime who truly are the innocent and most vulnerable of the system as a whole. My broader objection as it relates to what I have seen of the record is when there is a judicial opinion drafted by the nominee in which she cites the New York Times for a quote that our criminal justice system is unfair and unjust. To me, that raises very specific questions about whether <coughs> the nominee fully embraces whether or not our system is broken or whether or not she believes that the system works. Because to the extent that there continues to be the mindset that our system is unjust, then not only does it undermine the rule of law, but the ability of law enforcement to do their job and the public's confidence in the system in which we all hold dear. Uh, Mr. Russell, I'm mindful of the fact that Judge Jackson told us more than once that critical race theory never entered into her uh, uh, opinions or uh, maybe even a matter of discussion. If a judge or justice is making decisions based upon that theory and those principles, how might we see that reflected in their opinions? Well, thank you for that question. Um, I think that uh, based on my expertise in religious liberty and constitutional law, I think you always have to start with the, the original meaning of the Constitution and understand that regardless of the changing of the culture and what the social structure might call for, the standard never changes. And that ensures that there's an anchor 
um, and there's constantly a, um, a, a foundation to go back to. And so if you look at the Constitution uh, through the lens of CRT, then you're going to assume that it's inherently um, flawed and incorrect, and you're less likely to view it as being uh, something or a source that you need to go back to or a source that should be relied upon, and certainly not in the original meeting, because the original meaning is going to be inherently discriminatory if you look at it through that lens. And so if you see it reflected in opinion, say in a religious liberty case, you might be inclined to say change that original meeting in order to reflect the current culture's new understanding of what religious liberty should mean. Thank you, Vice Thank you, Senator Grassley. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Ms. Russell, Ken Klukowski worked for First Liberty before he went to the Department of Justice to become senior counsel to Assistant Attorney General Jeffrey Clark and participate there in the drafting of a proposed letter in an effort to overturn the presidential election in Georgia. Did you personally or did your organization have any role in helping to prepare or facilitate the preparation of that letter proposed by Jeffrey Clark? No. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Marshall, you were um, the chairman of the Republican Attorney General's Association and the Rule of Law Defense Fund in the run-up to the January 6th assault on the Capitol. Um, and Rule of Law Defense Fund sent robocalls urging recipients to march to the Capitol uh, on January 6th. Were you personally present in Washington, D.C. on January 6th? Your microphone should probably come on. I was not. Did uh, RAGA or RLDF have staff present here? Can't, can't speak to that, but Senator, what I can tell you is that we have denounced lawlessness. Not only is it related to what took place on January 6th, but also the lawlessness that continues to go on across our country with violent crime. And what I would hope Could is you, as part of this hearing that this body is likewise questioning our nominee about her philosophy on criminal justice as it relates to decisions she would make on the court. Did you personally know of or approve the text of the robocall that went out from RLDF? No. Did you, do you know how that robocall was funded? Was that out of general revenues of RLDF or was a specific solicitation made to fund it? No knowledge. No knowledge? Did you personally solicit funding for that robocall? Senator, I've made multiple comments here already. The question before this body is the nomination. I get to ask Jackson. the questions. Yes, sir. And, and my what question I am telling you is, is that we have denounced what took place that day as we do money continue to denounce for the, the RLDF place across robocall this country. that day. Pr pretty simple question. Yes or no, did you personally solicit money to support the robocall that brought people to the Capitol uh, and who then assaulted the Capitol? No. Very well. Um, did you have any contact with members of Congress in any effort to keep the electoral process open through objections to give those coming to assault the Capitol time to breach the Capitol and disrupt the elections process? No. Um, have you offered any testimony to the January 6th Commission? I've not been asked. You've not been asked. Um, as you sit here, you enjoy the protection of the Capitol Police officers who are here and who defended our Capitol against the assault on January 6 uh, by the crowd that your organization helped recruit. Do you have anything to say to them, particularly to those who were injured in the line of duty on that day? Sir, I object to the premise of your question that somehow or another the organization I was connected with had anything to do with the violence that took place. We've denounced that violence before and as I've done with you here today. Um, is Joseph R. Biden of Delaware the duly elected and lawfully serving president of the United States of America? He is the president of this country. 
Is he the duly elected and lawfully serving President of the United States? He is the President of our country. Are you answering that omitting the language duly elected and lawfully serving purposefully? I'm answering the question, he is the President of the United States. And you have no view as to whether he was duly elected or is lawfully serving? I'm telling you he's the President of the United States. No further questions. Senator Cornyn. To me, one of the most important aspects of the confirmation hearings is the opportunity to revisit first principles about our government, separation of powers, freedom of speech. Ms. McCollum, thank you for your eloquent testimony about the importance of free speech. But I want to, Professor Mascott, I want to start with you and take you back to the Declaration of Independence, where it says that government derives its just powers from consent of the governed. And while uh, we heard a lot from uh, the nominee about staying in her lane, not making policy and the like, um, I personally believe that many judges have a blind spot when it comes to things like substantive due process or articulating new and unenumerated rights and eliminating any discussion or debate or even vote on some of those rights that they discover because the judiciary says this is the way it is and we don't care what anybody else thinks. Could you just describe for us uh, the danger of, of eliminating from consider the governed um, some of these important decisions under the guise of judicial lawmaking, like substantive due process? Yes, Senator. Thank you for the question. And I, I think it's great to go back to uh, considering the consent of the governed, obviously, because the right of the people and liberty is foundational to our constitutional system. And as my uh, written testimony goes through in more depth than I mentioned today, I mean, I think there are multiple structural limitations in the constitutional system, some that we often overlook, that lead to quite a modest role for uh, judges. So first, you know, there's the role of federalism of the states, the people, our important institutions like religious bodies, the family continuing to have a great say, we the people, um, that limits really the um, power under the text of the Constitution that the federal government in any branch is supposed to exercise. The federal government is one of limited powers, correct? That's correct, Senator, listed in Article I of the U.S. Constitution. And so that uh, structural constraint is the first threshold thing to be, be considering when thinking about the federal role and the um, where we were the source of the legal and constitutional authority for law to begin with. And then even within that system, System, as this body's discussed many times, um, there's the separation of powers among three branches. And of course, with the with Congress being uh, closest in elections to the American people and the president being elected, the role of the judiciary is quite modest. Forgive is me, quite since, modest. Our since our time is limited, sure. let me ask another question. Um, and when judges get outside their lane, when they make policy, when they make political value judgment, does it violate those principles that you've articulated about our form of government and the limitations on a judicial power? Uh, yes, Senator, which is why it's important to have a muscular reliance on the text and structure of the Constitution and statutes. Ms. Uh, Russell, we um, I know your practice involves protection and defense of, of uh, religious liberty. That's another provision of the First Amendment that uh, Ms. McCollum addressed that uh, beyond free speech, the freedom of religion in our country. And when, when the Supreme Court justices identify new unenumerated rights and hold that no state, no local government can enact any policy in conflict with that new right that they identify, does that potentially endanger the um, religious liberty of, of Americans? Well, yeah, it definitely could um, if you are not taking into account sort of the, as I said, the foundational importance of religious liberty and you um, instead um, usurp that with the new right that you've created that was likely not considered when the initial provisions of the Constitution were drafted. And in the Oberfeld case, uh, I think Justice Alito and, uh, and perhaps Justice Thomas and others expressed their concerns that uh, when 
judges make law and create a national standard and take these issues out of the debate that they ordinarily would uh, be subject to in the political system and the legislative branch, uh, that basically people who don't agree with it, let's say because of sincerely held religious belief, could be identified as bigots. Well, do, you, do you share that concern? Well, yes, because certainly if you create a new right based on the current prevailing culture and the, their thoughts about um, whatever it might be, uh, generally speaking, you're going to end up in a situation where everyone who has a traditional view of those subjects are going to be seen as the enemy and they will be demonized in the culture. And it's the ultimate cancel culture. Ultimately, yes. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Cornyn. Senator Klobuchar. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair Durbin, and thank you to all of you. Um, Representative Beatty, thank you so much uh, for your leadership and for being here today. Uh, you talked about, uh, in your testimony, about how there have been 115 justices and only um, she will be the first, Judge Jackson, uh, if confirmed, will be the first black woman. And she will also be the first public defender. So those are two firsts sitting in the room where it happens, offering a different perspective. Could you give us your perspective? Two things. One, on what that means uh, as someone that knows what it's like to go into an institution that didn't have different perspectives. That would be the House of Representatives. And two, just your view as a black woman about the hearing yesterday. Let me start with your last question. And first of all, Senator, thank you for that. Uh, as I witnessed yesterday and certainly want to say to Congressional Black Caucus member Senator Cory Booker, thank you yesterday. Uh, it was emotional. It was heartfelt. But it also spoke not only to black America, but to America of how valuable this will be because what we will see when she is confirmed is what America looks like. We are no longer looking at where we were 56, 65 years ago, but yet we're still fighting for the same thing. So I say to little girls and especially little black girls, it will be important for them to see that they could do what her best friend said of her when they were 12 and 14 years old. I think it builds hope for America. And we know that all too often as elected officials and wanting to get more people who are representative of this wonderful America that we live in. And that includes making the change and having the courage as senators to confirm a black woman, not because she's black. And this is what I want you to hear loud and clearly, but because she is qualified more qualified than most we have seen in this room. And that's not just based on my opinion or my thought, but it is based on facts. It is based on when you look through the 600 some opinions, when you look through the 12,000 pages that were sent here on what she did on the United States Sentencing Commission, the 70-some thousand pages that came from the Obama library, when you look at what all the fact-finding checkers have said about her record, I say look to each of us, and this is why it is important to me. There is not a perfect person in this room. Yesterday, a minority senator said he did not agree with everything that his colleagues were saying. So I think you can look at anything or any person and find something that you want to find fault with. But in this case, there are so many things that she has just been impeccable on her reverence for the rule of law, for her impeccable decision making. She is not perfect, but she is amazing. And that's what I want America to know. And I just want to end with this because I am also chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. And I want you to know while we are very diverse, our power is our un unity. And we embrace and endorse her 100%. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Henderson, uh, you've been a leader on voting rights. <coughs> Yesterday, uh, Judge Jackson talked about how the right to vote is a fundamental right. 
in our democracy, as other nominees have said in the past. How can the court, in your view, particularly after what happened yesterday with the shadow docket case in Wisconsin, uh, work to reestablish public confidence in voting rights cases? Very quickly. Thank you for the question. Thank you also for your leadership in trying to protect democracy in your role as chair of the Rules Committee. I think the court has a very important role to play to preserve the right of all Americans uh, to the vote. We now see uh, democracy under attack in unprecedented ways. It certainly began with the January 6th insurrection, but it continues now at the state level in some uh, states uh, that are rolling back uh, protections that guarantee the right to vote. I am hopeful that the court will re-examine uh, the role it has taken with regard to the Voting Rights Act, which it has stripped of its essential powers at the Supreme Court level. And I think case, a case has been made that there is a need for a new uh, structured uh, Voting Rights Act uh, and we hope, of course, that the Senate will ultimately come to accept that uh, that requirement. Well, thank you. Mr. Chair, I'm not going to ask another question, but I did want to say to you, Mr. Rosenthal, uh, as someone who's kept my friends since middle school and high school, um, I especially enjoyed your testimony. And it reminded me of uh, when I asked one of Sonia Sotomayor's friends in a similar panel, who was a friend from middle school or high school, what she was like at that point. Maybe it was elementary school. <laughs> And he said, judicious. And I thought, <laughs> so I enjoyed it very much. Thank you to all the witnesses. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Uh, we've been told by the Republican staff that the order based on early bird rule on their side is Senators Lee, Tillis, Blackburn, and Cruz. Uh, it appears, Senator Tillis, you're next up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you all for being here. I, I listened to your testimony and watched it in my office. Uh, Mr. Rosenthal, you get married in a in a, a couple of weeks. Yes, Senator. I'd also uh, wish that your uh, father returns to good health. Thank you, um, Captain Thomas. Thank you for your law enforcement service and your service in Iraqi freedom, um, Ms. McCollum. I uh, I think this is the first time I've asked somebody questions who were actually a plaintiff in a Supreme Court case. Uh, it's an honor. Um, your testimony was uh, unbelievable. Before I leave today, I hope I can get one of your cards. I think oh, it reads sure. Hope, <laughs> Health, and Love. Hope, uh, Health, and Love. Um, so you were at this abortion clinic uh, as a counselor? Yes. Sidewalk counselor. Um, yesterday, I tried to make the distinction because I think some people were approaching that case as a pro-life or pro-choice case, and I was trying to make the point it was about uh, freedom of speech. You agree with that? I think you said that in your testimony? Sure. Now, in the amicus brief that was created, I think there were quotes in there. So these weren't words necessarily of those who created the amicus brief, but they were quotes from, I guess, um, the, the plaintiffs in the, in the original case that uh, you were mean, uh, in your face, uh, aggressive, and I think that the other quotes said that they even felt like they may be shot by you. Now, I know that was a couple of years ago, but that seems to be not characteristics of your behavior. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. What, yeah. would, can you, you were out there, you, yeah. you were not the only one. Were there others out there as life counselors or? Sure. Yeah. Were, were I, any of them mean? in your face people that look likely to shoot somebody? No, absolutely okay. not. So tell me a little bit about the bound. I'm sorry, I got to go quick because I'd like That's to hear okay. you talk. I'd like for you to repeat your opening statement. Um, but um, tell me about the, the um, I was trying to get with Judge Jackson yesterday, who incidentally, Congresswoman, I think is eminently qualified. And, and I find it hard to believe that anybody on my side of the aisle would disagree with that. So this has more to do with the application of philosophy and uh, worldviews that could potentially influence. But I, I think you should make no mistake that uh, I agree with the ABA that she is highly qualified, and I'm glad to see she got that rating. But the, 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 uh, I'm trying to get an idea of what it was like on the ground. They were telling you, now one of the reasons you mentioned in your testimony that you may have to raise your voice is you were so far away from these young expectant mothers who may not have ever known that there was a choice of life 
that right. would fulfill them like uh, the mother who sent you the picture of her three-month-old baby um, yes. who's now in her teens. So I could understand if you're several feet away, you may have to raise your voice just to get their attention. Maybe that's what they meant by shouting and in your face. But um, with the Supreme Court striking, ultimately striking down the underlying Massachusetts law that was used as a basis um, for the complaint, um, were there people that were inside the envelope or, or maybe, I, I was trying to determine whether there were people that were escorting them in, which are basically expressing their free speech rights to choice. Were they there or was it just that, I mean, so were there people inside the buffer who were able to escort them in and your argument was that you want to be there to give, hold their hand, I think you said, never walk the journey alone. Um, is that an accurate portrayal of the facts on the ground? that you felt like you were not given uh, uh, fair. fair access? Fair, that's true. Okay. Because, yes, you, you, you have it there, Senator. And, uh, yes, they are inside the buffer zone, and they're, all, they're talking to the mother-to-be. That's what I thought. That's why I just we're wanted not, to get it right. Yes. And I think it's wonderful that you're here because um, uh, you're, you're either an Oscar-winning uh, actor or actress <laughs> are the fact of the matter is that was a wholly unfair assertion yeah. of who you were. Um, just a quick question. I actually had one for Miss Russell and Miss Mascot. I'm not going to have time for both. Uh, so Miss Mascot, you talked about in your opening testimony, the application and practice. Um, I was thinking about a case that um, Senator Cornyn brought up that had to do with the, uh, the, 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 uh, congressional direction, the plain word of the statute said that the, the removal, the, t the two, are you familiar with this? Are you talking about make the road, New yeah. York? Yeah. Okay. And it was my understanding that Judge Jackson used as a basis for the uh, nationwide injunction that it did not comply with the APA, but that seems to be a tactic every once in a while, even though the plain letter of the text seemed like, um, and, and I think it's the reason why it was ultimately um, struck down by the D.C. Circuit, but uh, do you know of any other examples where Ms. Jackson may have uh, applied a similar logic uh, to a case? Well, in that particular case that you're speaking of, I think it was it was not, it failing to rely on a provision that clearly limited the, the role of the courts and gave the discretion to make the decision to the um, acting uh, Department of Homeland Security secretary. I think in other opinions, um, what seems to be the case is that Judge Jackson is using a blend of sources, perhaps relying on legislative history or looking at intent or purpose more than other justices in the past who have expressed exclusive commitment to textualism or maybe um, in applying canons of construction, perhaps moving beyond text sometimes in a way that might be different from other justices in the past, like Justice Scalia and Thomas. So, of course, it's hard to predict based on district court rulings how a judge will rule, but there are these other instances like the one you mentioned or in the McGann case well, um, and, where the D.C. Circuit disagreed that sorry, suggests maybe... in the, the interest of time, no. because I know we have a vote. Uh, I'd be very interested, thank you for that, uh, but I'd be very interested uh, as a follow-up if you have time over the next week to uh, just provide me a few specific examples if, if you can. You don't have to go to a great level of detail, but I would appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. And Ms. McCollin, do you have one of those cards? I'm going to get it on the way out. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Tillis. Uh, this isn't a coup. Uh, Senator Durbin has gone to vote, and uh, as is customary, one of the members of the committee takes his place. Uh, and I'm in the chair now, uh, Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut, and uh, very pleased to have my round of questioning while I am taking the chair for Senator Dur Durbin. Uh, let me ask Dean Goloboff, uh, you have a, an extraordinary career yourself as a trailblazer, the first female dean at the University of Virginia. You had a distinguished clerkship with Justice Breyer, and before that, our good friend Guido Calabresi, one of the most distinguished judges and scholars in the United States at the Yale Law School, where you went as well. Uh, a number of us on this panel have talked about the legitimacy crisis that the Supreme Court faces. 
maybe the result of self-inflicted wounds, maybe the result of the times in which we live. But Justice Breyer's very thoughtful, deliberate, methodical approach, as was outlined by Judge Jackson as well, seems to be one of the hallmarks of his ability to bring the court together to overcome divides and disagreements, which in my view is very important at this point in the court's history. Would you agree? I would. And maybe you could elaborate as to why that is important for this court at this moment in its history. I think the court's authority, as Professor Mascott has been talking about, in the separation of powers really comes from its deliberative nature. It doesn't have the power of the sword. It doesn't have the power of the purse. What it has is uh, its reality and perception of being a neutral arbiter. Uh, and I think Ju Justice Breyer played a critical role in uh, enhancing and facilitating deliberation across all of the justices of the court. And I think everything that we know about Judge Jackson suggests she will do exactly the same thing. So the lack of trust and credibility is a threat to the court because it doesn't have armies or police forces or, as you say, the power of the purse. What it has is the trust and respect of the American people. Yes, that's something Justice Breyer talks about frequently in his writing and in his speaking, uh, is the fact that without the trust of the American people, the court simply can't do its job. The rule of law, the, the justices are committed to the rule of law, and the rule of law exists because the American people follow the rule of law and only do so when they have faith in the court. Um, let me ask, uh, and I think that point is very well said, uh, Congresswoman Beatty and uh, Mr. Henderson, uh, we are celebrating here a remarkable achievement. I've said it should have happened long ago. It's a leap into the present in the historic nomination by President Biden, the first black woman to the United States Supreme Court. But as much as we celebrate, as I pointed out yesterday, the decisions of the court in Shelby County and Burnovich that essentially have set us back, and especially in this area of voting rights, John Lewis was a great friend and hero to you and to me uh, on integration, backsliding as well. Maybe I can ask you to reflect on both of you, because you have such deep and broad experience and expertise in this area, about the ways that the Supreme Court has reversed some of the progress that was made in our own lifetime. Ms. Beattie, uh, Congresswoman Beattie, why don't you go first? Well, first of all, let me just say thank you for uh, that question. And I am sure that Congressman John Lewis is looking down on us in a hopeful manner especially as it relates to civil rights and voting rights. I think what we have to look at first, as was said by both of the professors, that the, the power is not in the policy or the Congress. So I think what this does with this confirmation would be, it would be a hope for the people out there to help us as members of Congress and also as senators that we have to first do our job. And I think we have an obligation to help those justices by sending them policy, sending them voting rights legislation that they can then do within the rule of the law what the people are looking for. So I think that it starts here. And I think that question is so wonderful as I am sitting here as a member in the majority, with members in the majority and the minority, that the work starts with the House and the Senate. And so if that question would allow me to say that I am willing, because voting rights is the fundamental of everything that we talk about right now, whether it is the freedom of speech, whether it is working with our police, whether it is being the voice for those who are voiceless, let's start by saying we're going to give not only this justice, but all of the justices something that they can look at and rule on because we've sent them something that we're united. And I would ask, since I'm here today and with that question, that I ask my colleagues that we start with voting rights legislation, that we look at where we are with nullification, 
if we look at where we are in that case with preclearance, if we look at history, the voting rights are in with this, and you know this well. The Voting Rights Act has been reauthorized in a bipartisan way five times. Four Republican presidents reauthorized the Voting Rights Act. Wouldn't this be a wonderful time in this America to build a better America if this Senate and this Congress could come together and send our justices something that they could rule on that would be reflective of our democracy? Thank you. Mr. Henderson? Senator Blumenthal, thank you so much for the question. Let me say at the outset that I support completely the response of uh, uh, Congresswoman Beatty. Uh, and believe her answer was full and complete. But let me also say that the right to vote is foundational of all other rights, as, ju as, uh, as Congresswoman Beatty alluded to. And so all the issues that we've discussed this morning, from free speech to uh, the rights of uh, individual victims in cases of police accountability or others, are all uh, tied to the right to vote. The Supreme Court decision, beginning with the Shelby County decision in 2013, with the uh, uh, Abramovich uh, decision of a couple of years ago, and recent interpretations of what the court has done by district court judges, raise serious questions about the fidelity of the court uh, to the role that Congress has been designated to address discrimination under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. The fact that the court seems to have gone out of its way to find ways of eviscerating the protection of the Voting Rights Act has taken us back, literally, to the period that existed prior to 1965 when the Voting Rights Act was adopted. Some people consider that criticism to be hyperbolic. But the truth is the facts make clear that what is happening now to voters, particularly voters of color, younger voters, seniors, individuals with disabilities are, in fact, violations of that fundamental right to vote. When we deny access uh, to the ballot, therein lies the problem. And so we have petitioned uh, Congress, specifically the Senate, uh, to enact new provisions that would help to protect the right to vote. We are disappointed that uh, earlier this year, that effort was not undertaken uh, by the with the complete bipartisan support of the Senate. But we hope that in the future that will happen. I remind you that 16 members, Republican members of the Senate, who voted for the Voting Rights Act in 2006 in the reauthorization, have so far been silent on this question of whether to move forward on the act. We hope they have a second opportunity to do Thank so. You. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Mr. Henderson. I'm going to call on Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this uh, very much and the opportunity uh, to have you all before us. This has been really quite a week here in the Senate Judiciary Committee. Ms. McCullen, I would like to come to you first. I am so happy that you are with us today, and I appreciated your comments. Thank I'm you. a mother and a grandmother, and I like how you talked about walking with women as they transition from their pregnancies to yes. that motherhood and realizing the need to continue to support women after they have those babies um, and to support them um, as they go through this entire process. Likewise, I know that you do some good work to support post-abortive women. Yes, I do. Who just have, they grieve. And acquaintances mm. that I know that have been through that process, there is a grief that is just many times hard to bear. It's true. So appreciate your work. And I know you have a card that you give to women. I do. Uh, talk to me uh, just a little bit about that, very quickly. Sure. Well, I have an extra <clears throat> one here, too. Uh, and when I'm walking and a young mother comes up to me, I, as I said earlier, I say, good morning. I'm Eleanor. How can I help you? And I give them the card at the same time. The card has hope, help, and love. 
and my telephone number. I'm not afraid to give that out. It has my website. <clears throat> and then on the back, a person's a person, no matter how small. I love <laughs> yeah. that. I so I just give that out. It, it just yeah. shows that I'm not, I'm trying not to be a stranger. And in just a yeah. few moments, Senator, I'm building up trust. And at least they have a name and a number, and I'm not just out there for no reason. I, I have a purpose. I appreciate that. Let yeah. me ask you this. How did it make you feel <clears throat> in Judge Jackson's brief when yes. she referred to pro-life women as hostile, noisy crowd of in-your-face protesters? Well, as I said, it made me very sad, extremely sad. And that's not the case at all. In fact, if someone is doing those things, harassing or yelling, the sidewalk is not a place for anger. It's not a place for judgment. Anyone that comes to be a sidewalk counselor should be compassionate, not judgmental, and helpful and kind. So yeah. we have workshops. I run the workshops. If okay. a new person let wants me, to let be... Let me move on just sure. a minute. But thank you yeah. for that work. Uh, Ms. Mascot, may I come to you, please? Yes, I uh, closed out last night with Judge Jackson reading back to her some of her opening statement. Now, everyone up here, as I've listened to you all, the ABA, uh, their witnesses that were with us earlier, you talk about preserving our form of government. You talk about preserving equal access, equal justice. And there was a comment in Judge Jackson's opening that I read back to her because she left out something very important. I'm going to read this to you, and I'd like your comment. I've been a judge for nearly a decade now, and I take that responsibility and my duty to be independent very seriously. I decide cases from a neutral posture. I evaluate the facts, and I interpret and apply the law to the facts of the case before me without fear or favor, consistent with my judicial oath. And I told her... There was a word missing from that that I thought deserved more attention. And that was, it should have been there that it should be consistent with the Constitution. Because that should be where a justice goes first. Is that not correct? Th that is correct, Senator. And I think largely because the Constitution, of course, gives the federal government only limited enumerated powers. And so to be able to have a context for interpreting relevant statutory text, one first needs to think about whether Congress and um, the federal government is authorized to take the action in the first place and where the text then falls within the constitutional structure and the judge's role in interpreting it. And, you know, uh, we had a very difficult time, never got her to nail down her judicial authority, her judicial philosophy. That concerned us. There's another thing I want to ask you about. This is um, where she talked about CRT in sentencing. This was from a 2015 speech. And I, I felt like this was really inappropriate. Uh, I also try to convince my students that sentencing is just plain interesting on an intellectual level, in part because it melds together myriad types of law. Criminal law, of course, but also administrative law, constitutional law, critical race theory. Is critical race theory a type of law, Ms. Mascot? Well, Senator Blackburn, I, I teach a number of courses at Scalia Law School, and, and none none involve critical race theory, so I would not be the best best expert on that. As far as sentencing, though, I think, again, in that area as in all, it's important to focus on the text of law, and, of course, Congress um, at the federal level would have the largest role in terms of establishing the range of appropriate sentences for a crime, and so folks applying that, of course, um, always uh, would be looking to the text of the laws put into place by Congress. Congress has, over the years, given a lot of discretion, but could narrow it if it decided that judges were not applying the role properly. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, before I... I, I want to ask you, uh, some of us have wanted those pre-sentencing memos. Are we going to be able to have access to those memos? I know we sent a letter to you. We've Where do we stand? Well, we've that? consulted with prosecutors and with victims' rights organizations, and they share my concern. This is very confidential, sensitive information. 
which is usually only seen by a judge, and to, to run the risk of bringing it to this committee and jeopardizing our worse innocent. Is there no I'm, way I'm, we I'm, can end? I'd like to finish. Okay. Jeopardizing our worse innocent third parties, our children who have been victimized. I'm sorry, Senator, I'm not going to be party to that. I, I would not want that on my conscience that we did this for some political exercise here, which I think is totally unnecessary, and someone was harmed as a result of it. I'm going to resist it every step of the way. No one wants to harm children. Then leave what the reports concealed. Leave the reports concealed. And there's, well, what is in the reports that we cannot go into a classified setting I want to tell you something. If, if you are a parent of some child who's been exploited and you recognize this judge's name as perhaps have presided at the trial and realize that now the report, the, the report that has been kept in confidence all these years is now going to be handed over to the United States Senate Judiciary Committee, what would you think as a mother if it were your daughter or your child? I would think this is an act that is reckless. And to do this in the name of some political, well, we're going to pursue this one more step and request information that has never been requested before by the Senate Judiciary Committee, unacceptable. On my watch, I won't be party to it. I do not want this on my conscience, and I hope you don't either. I want to make certain that we protect children and that we continue to do our best effort to protect children. I also want to make certain that we're going to have judges on the federal bench and justices that are going to protect those rights of children. Well, the you, fact that you, you have, all have seen these, no, we haven't. No, you're the wrong, fact Senator. That even Senator, Judge you're wrong. Jackson referred. I can't see them. I don't want to see okay. them. Okay. And I want to make that clear. So okay. it has not been given to the White House, nor has it been given to any member of the Judiciary Committee that I know, and I am not going to be party to any effort Mr. Or Chairman nobody Mr. Chairman there is no one that wants to do anything that is going to Good. harm Good join me children join me we want to make certain that we do our due diligence and Mr. I know you have gotten frustrated with us with asking tough questions but that is our job You may ask to a tough that. question as long as it is fair and and that's all we ask Mr. Every Chairman, question if I we have asked has been fair Senator Coons. Mr. Chairman, could you just clarify um, for those uh, who may not be familiar with uh, the procedure and practice of uh, prosecution and sentencing, these PSRs, they were not in any case written by Judge Jackson. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, and they are not about Judge Jackson in any way. That is correct. Um, they are uniformly or nearly uniformly sealed by court action. Yes. Um, and involve detailed and thorough interviews of the whole ecosystem around a crime, the victim, the perpetrator, families, and are described to those interviewed as something that will be confidential, confidential. and sealed. Thank and, you. And let me just say that uh, I cannot imagine that we think we have to explore this area at the risk of innocent third parties and children. I will not be party to it. Mr. I'm Chairman. I'm not going to do it. Senator Booker. Again, this is new to me, and, and I, I'm sorry I never did... Uh, criminal law, um, but I've now asked a lot of prosecutors trying to be fair about this, and some of them served on this committee to understand. And the kind of confidential information, I thought, well, maybe you could redact it. And people were saying to me, no, you cannot even redact it. There is so much compromising confidential information that none of us would want out there. And uh, and Senator, who I have a lot of respect for and have, have actually thought her, a lot of her questions during this were thoughtful and probing and helped me, frankly. Um, um, but as she's new on the committee, but I know this, I've also asked this question. This is a body, this Judiciary Committee, that has, for Republican and Democratic presidents, done, am I fair to say, thousands of judges have been put onto federal benches. And this is a new territory. We have never asked for this kind of confidential information from a third branch of government. It's just never been done. And when you cross a precedent like this, now I've seen this having been eight years in the Senate, what you're going to create now, first of all, this information should never be released to politicians, in my opinion. There's, no, there's, no, there's nothing additive to it. But what you do when you cross that line is now you're going to create a new precedent. So some performative Democrat, when there's a Republican judge coming before us, is going to demand the same information. 
and use it or exploit it for political purposes. I don't think we want to cross that line in this body where we've never, this has never come up in hundreds, in the 200 years. Uh, uh, I don't know how long this information has been collected in this manner. It just seems like a really large step that I don't think, as you said yesterday, it's going to change the conclusions that have already been drawn by people on either side of the aisle. If somebody just wants to come forward and say, I'm on the fence on how I'm going to vote, this is the determinative thing, I just don't hear that. And the danger weighing these, the danger is really uh, in terms of changing the way this committee operates, impeding upon issues of privacy. Um, I think it's it, the danger way outweighs any probative value. I can't imagine for a moment a parent who has been somehow related to a child exploited in this circumstance, who lives in fear every day of what's going to be made public, what's going to show up on the internet, would, would view this as a, just a routine request for information. It is so much more than that. And I, as I said, on my watch, somebody can take this chair and this big gavel over and make a different decision. I'm not going to be party to it. I will not be party to exposing this information to the possibility of disclosure and the harm that can come from it. Senator Coons. Thank you, Chairman Durbin. Dean Goloboff, um, thank you uh, for your testimony today. Um, like Judge Jackson, you also uh, clerked uh, for Justice Breyer, um, and you're a well-respected dean of uh, prominent law school. I just wanted to ask a few quick questions of you and a number of other witnesses, if I might. Um, Judge Jackson's jurisprudence uh, has been uh, questioned or challenged, in particular with reference uh, to her opinion in uh, Make the Road New York. Is it your view that she, either in that case or in other cases you may have considered or reviewed, um, has overstepped the role of the court um, and has engaged in a jurisprudence that gets outside her lane uh, as a judge? Thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, it is absolutely my view that she does not get outside her lane. Uh, she, I think, comes down uh, in cases on both sides, uh, depending on uh, what she sees in the facts and how she applies precedents. I think she has been assiduous and conscientious, both in that case and in others, to think about precisely the kinds of questions that Professor Mascott mentions. What is the role of the court? How much deference to uh, offer to the other branches? Uh, how to ensure procedural consistency? Uh, she is, I think, quite consistent uh, and very uh, committed to, uh, to the text and to precedent. Um, and given your experience with Justice Breyer, what do you think uh, anyone who's clerked for the justice might uh, have learned about uh, an even-handed and impartial manner and consensus building on the court? Well, I certainly learned, and I think anyone who clerked for him uh, also learned that exactly what you described is crucial to being a good justice, uh, to taking every case on its own terms, to asking what the Constitution says about the particular case at hand, uh, which includes the original public meaning, which Judge Jackson has said, uh, but does not end with the original public meaning. Originalism is really a capacious term, and even among originalists, there are a lot of disagreements about how cases should come out. Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas disagree quite considerably about how much to consider precedent or not uh, in their own decisions. And the interpretive part of uh, constitutional interpretation is really the first part. You look to original public meaning, that's what just Judge Jackson has said she would do. And then the second part is you apply it. And you have to consider the facts of the case and precedent uh, when you do that. And I think Justice Breyer taught all of us that the best way to do that is in conversation with justices across the court uh, and taking the deliberative process very seriously, which he did, uh, creating real relationships across justices uh, so that you can have real conversations and learn from each other uh, as you wrestle with these really hard questions. I don't think we would spend quite so much time thinking about uh, the, the judge's approach or, uh, or qualifications if the interpretive process were just automatic and mechanical. It requires judgment. It requires discernment. And uh, that's what Justice Breyer taught us. To follow up on a previous exchange, do you have any doubt um, that Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. is the duly elected president of the United States? I do not. Thank you. Um, Captain, if I might, Captain Thomas, uh, I was a county executive of a county had the second largest police force in my admittedly small state. Um, we had a very active chapter of Noble. Uh, I have a long uh, working relationship with some Noble leadership, and I'm thrilled that you are here as the head of Noble, uh, our nation's largest law enforcement organization of black law enforcement officers, which has also endorsed Judge Jackson's nomination. How do you view her record, um, her commitment to public safety, her engagement with the law enforcement community? But Thank you, Senator. With all the information that we have received, different notes from different organizations, 
I feel very confident in her nomination for this uh, seat. I'd like to make a statement. Her temperament, her fairness, her respect for the law, and her honor of the Constitution make Judge Katani Brown Jackson exactly what we should expect from someone who will rule on matters that will affect our country and judicial system for generations. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Captain, and thank you for the clarity and forcefulness of that endorsement. Congresswoman, I might um, just ask you a closing question. I've been struck uh, at uh, Judge Jackson's a personal story and at the central role um, that the doors of opportunity opened by HBCUs to her parents has played in that impressive arc of her story. Um, I, I'd just be interested in your sharing with us the role that HBCUs play in our education system, in our nation, um, and in providing that remarkable pathway forward. Thank you for that question. Um, and as an HBCU graduate, as well as all five of my siblings, I can speak to that directly. I had an opportunity to probably attend any university that I wanted to, first generation going to college. But thank goodness for my parents who said to me that I would be more balanced and more grounded as a young girl coming from public school system in an inner city school, that they thought it was important for me to do that and then later go wherever I wanted to. I, I think it gives you that extra sense of, of confidence. I think it also made me value that diversity. I had people from the continent of Africa teaching me. It was the first time in my history that I had seen so many professors and scholars who looked like me. So it made me sore when I walked into other rooms. I think like Judge Jackson, when I heard her tell her story of how she felt that first week or month at Harvard, but it was, I believe, her success and confidence and when beneath her wing, her parents. Mm. Her parents in that grounding of HBCU universities, and that's what they do for so many of us. Thank you. So I think it plays a valuable role. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator Coons. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a moment ago, Senator Coons was having an exchange where, where he described Judge Jackson's jurisprudence as assiduously fair and even-handed. Uh, Professor Mascott, in, in Make the Road New York versus McAleenan, Judge Jackson found a cause of action to challenge the Department of Homeland Security's determination of the scope of which aliens are subge uh, subject to expedited removal. Um, in doing so, she disregarded the plain language of the statute that explicitly said the secretary had, quote, sole and unreviewable discretion to set the designation at any time. Uh, that decision resulted in a nationwide injunction preventing the Department of Homeland Security from removing illegal aliens from this country. That decision was reversed by the D.C. Circuit unanimously. Uh, in your judgment, was, was her decision in Make the Road New York versus McAleenan um, uh, assiduously fair and even-handed? Well, Senator, I, I cannot sit in, 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 in judge motivation of, of what was driving no, no, particular the, interpretation. The in terms of the, the interpretation of the statutory text and structure, the opinion overlooked the clear discretion that was given to the Acting Secretary of Homeland Security in the expedited the, removal the context. The plain and explicit text of the statute. The correct. plain and explicit text of the, of the statute and actually text of the statute that had been applied several times previously when... Um, acting heads of, of the Department of Homeland Security had, using just policy notice, ch made changes in next body removal. Th th thank you. Uh, let, let, let me shift. Uh, Ms. Serrano, thank you for the work you do uh, with children who are victims of sexual exploitation. The work you do is, is very, very powerful. As you know, um, significant concern has been raised by myself and others uh, about Judge Jackson's uh, pattern in sentencing criminal defendants guilty of either possession or distribution of child pornography. Uh, in the Harvard Law Review, she wrote uh, a note advocating a new way of examining restrictions on sexual offenders and, and arguing for a standard that, if applied, 
uh, would likely result in striking down the sexually violent predator civil commitment laws in states across the country and could arguably uh, also strike down the sex offender registry laws across the country. Ms. Serrano, what would be the effect uh, if the view she articulated in the Harvard Law Review was adopted by the Supreme Court and if those laws in turn were struck down? I'm not familiar with uh, Judge Jackson's uh, writing in the Harvard Law Review, but I can tell you that um, sex offender registry plays a critical part in allowing the community to identify where people who have demonstrated um, by their conviction of a, a sexual interest in children or other exploitative behavior such as rape or that sort of thing. As far as civil commitment, there are certainly um, state laws. I'm not familiar with all of them, um, but there is a process in which um, it, the uh, due process is done whether uh, someone uh, should be civilly committed um, because they cannot function in society due to their sexual deviance. So, Ms. Serrano, we've gone over in some detail. The, the Democrat talking point is that criticism about this issue is based on cherry picking. Um, yesterday, I gave Judge Jackson a, a chance to explain all of the child porn cases she's ever sentenced in. And that's a universe of 10 cases. Of them, five of them, uh, Downs, Cooper, Hess, Cain and Buttrey, five of them, she sentenced the statutory mandatory minimum, the absolute lowest sentence that was allowable under law. She has a pattern when there are prosecutorial recommendations of sentencing on average 48 percent less than the prosecutors have asked with regard to those in possession of child porn. And she repeatedly articulates, for example, in the Cooper case, and but she does this in, in every case, she articulates that she thinks the sentencing enhancement for the number of images of child porn makes no sense and isn't valid. And rather than having a five-level sentencing enhancement, she reduces it to a two-level enhancement. Ms. Serrano, d d does that make any sense to you, that, that, that there is no difference whatsoever between a defendant who is in possession of a single image versus another defendant who is in a possession of hundreds? or in, in one of the cases in front of Judge Jackson, someone that had 6,700 images uh, of children, some very, very young children, infants, toddlers. Does it make any sense that she would systematically say those are identical and that she's not going to apply the, the enhancement in the guidelines? Uh, thank you, Senator. I am not familiar with Judge uh, Jackson's sentencing. I apologize. I was doing my day job yesterday, so I wasn't able to watch uh, the, the hearings as much as I would have um, liked to. But I, I can share with you that the increases for the number of images, I think, accurately reflects the type of offender that you're dealing with. Somebody with, you mentioned 6,700, that's actually on the low side. Um, when I was doing uh, prosecuting cases, we're talking about people with terabytes or millions of images. And so somebody with that type of collection should uh, conceivably be sentenced more harshly than somebody with, say, 20 images or 50 images. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cruz. Senator Booker. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I actually really love uh, this. I've been through three Supreme Court justice hearings. And when the 10 people come forward from all different backgrounds in America, um, and, and people supporting a candidate and not supporting the can a candidate, it is always uplifting to me. And uh, I have a lot of respect and honor for everybody on this panel. You all are great Americans who are dedicated uh, to this country's highest ideals as you see them. And to give you an example of why I'm so serious, I had uh, in a previous panel of a Supreme Court justice I was dead set against, my constitutional law professor come in and be dead set for them. And I love this professor, still do, and I love him not just because he was a great professor, but also because he passed me. Uh, um, but uh, but uh, I just want you to know, you may feel partisan tension in this room, but there is a lot of respect uh, for the 10 of you who took time out of your schedule. Many of you traveled a very long way, and so I want to th say thank you. Mr. President, Mr. Captain, I want, my questions are for you, but if you don't mind, I'm going to take a quick minute to address the Congresswoman and just want to say a couple things uh, to her publicly uh, that are really important. First of all, the Congressional Black Caucus, it has been one of the greatest privileges of my life to be a member uh, of too few senators that have ever been a member of that body. And I want to say publicly, because this is true, um, I tried for years to get on this committee. 
And uh, the Congressional Back Caucus advocated for me for years, uh, went to Chuck Schumer and said, you need to get uh, Senator Booker, not just because you haven't had an African-American on there for a long time, but you guys saw faith in me that I could represent well here, and I just want to thank you for that. And the second thing is just very personally to you. Uh, I had one of the most difficult summers of my life last summer. Uh, you know this, my brother had a terrible stroke. And when you see people up here on this panel, you don't know what they all have been through. I did not know that the chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus had a horrific stroke at the age of 50 that left her seriously debilitated yes. to the point where you could not walk. And your story at my time of family crisis to me, uh, talk about tears. You, you were the, the one of the best people I spoke to by telling me your story. And I see you now sitting there. Uh, uh, it just is tremendous to me who you are and I've, I've, my depth of, of love and respect for you, especially showing up for me at a time I really needed it. Thank you. Uh, really quickly, sir. Uh, I love Noble. Uh, they were on my transition team to be uh, mayor of the city of Newark. I learned from your organization, your, uh, your recommendations to me about a city that uh, was really struggling with crime. Okay. And I, I'm happy to see uh, Honorable Marshall and others who have to live this life of knowing, confronting some of the ugliest parts of our country, which is what happens in communities that are struggling with, uh, with high rates of crime. I want to say for the record, because it often doesn't get said, uh, Chris Murphy's book put this data point in there that there is much gun violence in inner city communities as there are in uh, other low income communities that might be rural uh, and, and, and might uh, not have the same ethnic diversity. So I don't wanna pick on any communities here who are struggling with crime. Red states have high crime rates, blue states have crime rates. This is not a partisan issue. This is a human urgency. Um, I, I, have, I have shown up before ambulances at sites where young people have been shot. I've seen uh, the horror and have been traumatized in. And I have so much respect for police officers because what they go through every single day on the brink, often in the gap between safety and not safety. Uh, I have seen my officers, uh, I remember shooting where my officers ran in, no situational awareness, upstairs to see a woman who had committed suicide and had shot her baby. Mm -hmm. And then they go back to work the next day. And so I just wanna ask you that I'm done this one question because I know what's at stake. And here is a Supreme Court justice to the highest court in the land. And there have been people casting aspersions that she may not be the justice that would keep us safe. As a, as a person in this room, I, I doubt there's anybody more in this room right now that lives in that gap between safety uh, uh, and, and horrific uh, violence. Why are you so confident, despite all the aspersions that have been cast, that this person will be a phenomenal justice for the safety and security of families in America? The safety they're going to start with the law enforcement that we have present throughout the United States now. The Supreme Court justice just going to make it more, if it's something get before the Supreme Court dealing with law enforcement, it can make a difference, but we got to start at local level with the law enforcement. So that's why is my organization, NOVA, is so important. We out there discussing things with uh, high crime, gun violence, where we have a significant program, the law in your community. And it starts by a conversation to, st to stop a confrontation. So everybody get involved, get the chapter. We've got 50 chapters throughout the nation. We all try to get on the same page. The crime, it's gonna continue, but we can make it better. We're trying to build trust back in the communities with law enforcement. That's our main purpose. Judge Katani Jackson, she know about some of the neighborhoods. She grew up in Miami. Miami have a high crime rate. She said she saw it firsthand growing up. She saw it firsthand. So the decision when it comes to law enforcement is going to be important because we all got to live here in America. But we can start making a difference today by that nomination. And not just pass the nomination. We talk about the voting rights. We talk about everything in this. I'm saying I've been watching this uh, confirmation here and man for the, since Monday. I'm like, man, I don't believe this. Cause I've never been to this though. It's a big history class, you know, but, and civics class, I remember civics. But she gonna make, a, she can make a difference. Not only her, but she got eight other associates on that Supreme Court team with her. 
They all gonna have to sit down and talk and make this better together. One person not gonna solve this problem. One person not gonna make a difference. But you got eight other justices on that Supreme Court. And everything's going fine, people. America's doing a great job. I don't get caught up into the, the politics, the Democrats, the Republicans. I'm just being honest, I don't. But I know it's needed, and I know we got to get things done, so everybody got to work together. Everybody got to work together. But we do need Noble out there in the communities nationwide, so you need one in your city, contact Noble. <laughs> Amen. Everybody has to work together, Chairman. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Buchter and Captain Thomas. The next up is Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to all the witnesses for being here. Uh, Ms. Serrano, if I could just start with you, I want to say a particular thank you to you for the work and the incredible work that you do when it comes to human trafficking, child trafficking in particular. I know that you were 18 years as a federal prosecutor handling child pornography and child exploitation offenses. Those are, uh, those are terrible crimes to have to prosecute. And uh, I want to thank you for doing that and thank you now for the work that you do with Operation Underground Railroad. I mean, it's just incredible. I wonder if you could speak to us a little bit from your experience as a prosecutor and now as someone who is working to combat this epidemic of human trafficking, child sex trafficking in this country. It's a global epidemic, actually, but it's one, unfortunately, in this country, too. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you have seen in your experience about the connection between human trafficking and child pornography? So human trafficking is a, is a broad term that covers a, a bunch of different types of crimes, whether it's forced labor, et cetera. But within that, there's the sexual uh, sex trafficking. And oftentimes when you're dealing with sex trafficking of minors, part of the process to uh, break down the victim or potentially advertise the victim to sex buyers, um, traffickers or uh, folks uh, create uh, child pornography, which are sexually explicit pictures of children under the age of 18. Um, likewise, the flip side is if someone as a young child has been sexually abused as a child, perhaps uh, they were uh, victims of CSAM, child sex sexual exploitation material, they may not have gotten the uh, resources or aftercare, for example, that my organization provides to get them um, the help that they need and unfortunately, they become very vulnerable to become trafficked. So it's kind of like a chicken and the egg problem where sometimes one will influence or increase the other. So let me, let me ask you this. In terms of the children who are exploited in these images, is it fair to say that, that many of these children were uh, sex trafficked, that they are trafficking victims themselves? Uh, of the ones that we can identify, sometimes, yes. The, the, the children that are depicted in the child pornography or CSAM images, some of them are trafficked, yes. And, and what about the demand side of this? Because un unfortunately, the reason that there is human trafficking of any kind, including sex trafficking in children, is because there's a demand for it. And does, in your experience, does child pornography help drive the demand for human trafficking and sex trafficking of children? It can, yes. Um, an argument that I would routinely make before district judges in my district would be, you know, sometimes you have individuals who are looking at um, images online of child pornography, and then oftentimes uh, that will not satiate their uh, need for this material, and they'll go out and actually commit an offense. Um, it's no different than you walk by, and this is a very simplistic um, analogy, you know, you can walk by a bakery and smell the 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 sugary, you know, chocolate cake, but sometimes it, it gets to you so much you go in and buy a slice. Again, that's a very simplistic, I'm not trying to make light of it, but that's a very uh, simple analogy to explain it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And again, thank you for the incredible work that you do. Uh, Mr. Marshall, General Marshall, thank you for being here. You're a prosecutor. Um, you have been, uh, even before this role, which is a prosecutorial one, you were a district attorney. Let, let me just ask you, when you recommended sentences to judges, which you would do in your role as a, as a prosecutor, did you base your recommendation on what you thought was necessary to keep the public safe? Senator, absolutely, and also the egregious nature of the facts that we were dealing with. So if you made a recommendation to a judge and that judge went 90% or more below your recommendation that you thought was necessary to keep the public safe, would you be worried about uh, the effect that that might have in terms of endangering members of the community? Gravely concerned not only as it related to the particular case, but also the message it sent to the community about 
how we would hold individuals personally accountable for crimes they commit. So in other words, if you, if you have a judge who consistently sentences, let's say in an, in an area, let's say child pornography, below what you're, the government is asking for, what guidelines are asking for, you're saying that the message that that sends is, is that you're not very tough on this, you're not willing to hold these people accountable. Is that, have I got that right? Absolutely. So let me ask you this. You, you said also, you know, you sentence based on the gravity of, of the crime. When it comes to things like child exploitation and images that exploit children, would you say that the more, if you have an offender who has thousands of images, that that's probably worse than an offender who has one or two, and that you might want to sentence that offender with hundreds and thousands more than the person who has one or two? Is that a fair thing to say? It's, it's fair, and in fact, it's been my practice. You know, as somebody that has tried and convicted those who traffic in child pornography, I've had a chance to be able to see those images. Because one of the things that I also do as that advocate is for that child that is in that image that has been harmed as a result of what's taken place. And so not only do we want to be able to deter that conduct, but also we want to be able to be that voice for the voiceless in this case and those so children whose images are being trafficked. Because they often, I mean, the, the kids who have been trafficked, their images have been used, uh, they often don't have anybody to speak for them, right? I mean, you come into court, the judge has got to do justice. In a way, the judge has got to do justice by them on behalf of them because there's nobody to speak for them. And it's not like they don't get to prosecute the case, right? A lot of times we don't even know who these kids are. We can't find them. We can't help them. So it's really up to the court to do something on their behalf. Is that fair to say? The court is the ultimate voice. Yeah. I wish that uh, Judge Jackson shared your perspective, General. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I want to apologize to Senator Rono. <laughs> I recognize Senator Booker, and she was next in line. I hope she will forgive me. And I forgive I'll, you. Thank you. <laughs> now I recognize. Well, if you're asking for forgiveness, I was supposed to read something in the, in the, into the record uh, just to ask Senator Hirono. Uh, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund asks that we enter their report into the record. May I, may I do that? Go ahead. That, I, I would like to ask for that to be entered into the record. Without objection. Thank you very I'm much. Not patient. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Catherine Thomas, Noble's uh, support for Judge Jackson is a powerful counter to the foundless charge that Judge Jackson is soft on crime. I thank all of you for being here. Congresswoman Beatty, uh, we all know that Judge Jackson is eminently qualified. Her character, her integrity, her humanity, her kindness, her fairness, her leadership, these were qualities that were apparent from a really young age. And I, and I thank Mr. Rosenthal for uh, telling us about what she was as a young uh, girl. Um, it's an incredible story, and I, I really enjoyed listening to you. Congresswoman Beatty, as you listened to Judge Jackson yesterday, especially when she talked about um, her experience at Harvard and the need for perseverance, I was going to ask you whether you could relate to that. But clearly, you could. And so could I. Do you think the message of perseverance is a powerful message, especially to black women and girls in this country? I, I, first of all, let me just say not only thank you for the question, but thank you for your service and what you represent. I think it is an extremely powerful and needed message that we send out to little girls, all little girls, but specifically those who are of color. And I think what you saw yesterday builds for our children, grandchildren, and those yet unborn. Because even today, we are fighting for things that we were fighting for in 1963, 64, 65, and 68. So today could not only be landmark as we do this, it could propel us for the future that every little girl yeah. will then believe that she can soar. And believe me, as an immigrant poor kid, I can relate. Uh, and, and it was a just, very touching moment yesterday. Let me just quickly say this because we talk about the rule of law, I think you also have to look at judicial temperament. Mm -hmm. And what you saw yesterday beyond her talking about her early childhood was her response to the tough questions, maybe I think some unfair questions, you saw judicial temperament. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, Dean Goldboff. Uh, we know that uh, many of the Supreme Court decisions are unanimous or um, uh, pretty close to that, but then we're seeing more and more five to four or six to three decisions. And as I said, we have a very, in my view, an ideologically divided court. And you were asked earlier uh, what the impact of, of, of 
uh, these kinds of split decisions, especially in areas of voting rights, LGBTQ plus rights, um, <laughs> abortion rights, workers' rights, union rights. These are the most consequential kind of cases where we can expect more split decisions. Judge Jackson was asked repeatedly about her judicial philosophy, and she does have one. It has to do with her methodology. I wanted to ask you, do you think all of our justices should view themselves as originalists? I think every justice has to read the Constitution as they think they should. I think they have to be committed to the Constitution uh, and committed to the judicial role in the uh, constitutional scheme, but I, I do not personally think that everyone has to have the same approach to the Constitution. I agree with you because as an example of an originalist, if we were to follow Justice Scalia's view of originalism, we would not have same-sex marriage in our country because the Obergefell case would have been decided very differently under Justice Scalia's view of originalism. And in fact, Justices Thomas and Alito, also originalists, and in their view, they've already signaled that they would like to revisit Obergefell. I think the LGBTQ plus community is very, very concerned about that. For Mr. Anderson, uh, Henderson, excuse me, thank you very much also for being here. You represent an organization deeply committed to protecting the rights and civil liberties of all Americans. What would you tell Americans who want to know if a future Justice Jackson will stand up for them and protect their rights? Thank you for the, <clears throat> thank you for the question, Senator. Um, let, let me say, I begin first with, Senate, uh, with uh, Judge Jackson's preparation for the role that she hopefully is about to assume. Uh, and you've heard uh, both in the days that she testified and again today how exemplary her credentials are, how she has prepared herself in a way that was really destined for this moment. Uh, she has the embodiment of fairness and judicial temperament. She brings a level of uh, excellence and preparation unparalleled in the appointment of Supreme Court justices. There is a deep sense of commitment to fairness that she exudes both in her writings as a judge, but also in her daily uh, interactions both on and off the court, there is a fundamental sense of inherent fairness that she certainly embodies. And I think all Americans and persons who are not uh, American citizens but are in this country are guaranteed that she will approach the Constitution with fairness and will approach the individual circumstances of the cases before her. I think that's all we could possibly ask a justice to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Padilla. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, over the last three days, we've heard uh, over and over again, as we should, about the incredible qualifications that Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson has to serve on the Supreme Court. And I know I've touted them each and every day of this hearing myself. Uh, you, hopefully you've seen me do it if you've been watching the hearings. And I'm going to do it again here in a minute. Uh, but before I do, I want to explain why I'm doing it, why I keep doing it. It's because I do believe every American should know, should know Ketanji Brown Jackson, the judge, Ketanji Brown Jackson, the person, and the fact that she represents the very best of our country. That she's not just qualified, but extraordinarily qualified to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. And because of her qualifications and with her experiences, professional and life experiences that she brings, she will make the Supreme Court better, and she will make our country better. So uh, it is my sincere desire that for anybody watching these proceedings from the audience here in this room or from home or online, if you take nothing else away from these last four days, 
it's Judge Jackson's qualifications. A public school education, followed by degrees from Harvard College and Harvard Law School. Clerkships at the Federal District Court, at the Federal Court of Appeals, and the United States Supreme Court. Two years as a federal public defender. Two years as a staff member of the United States Sentencing Commission and four years as its vice chair. Three separate confirmations by the United States Senate, each time on a bipartisan basis, including two lifetime judicial appointments. Nearly a decade of judicial experience, <coughs> which is more than the combined total of four of the currently sitting justices at the time that they were nominated. And of course, the life experience as a black woman, as a working mom, and so much more. But it's not just her resume and background that makes Judge Jackson so qualified to serve on the Supreme Court. I've seen, we've all seen over the last three days, how she answered every question and met every unfounded, unfair, and insulting accusation with a level of grace, dignity, and patience that very, very few of us would be able to demonstrate under similar circumstances. And she demonstrated that she's sharp and thoughtful in her responses to legal questions. And she clearly has an understanding of and a commitment to the rule of law and the principle of equal justice. Now, based on her background, her experiences, and her qualifications, in my view, Judge Jackson merits strong bipartisan support from this committee and from the Senate as a whole. My question is this, and I address it to Congresswoman Beatty and to Mr. Henderson. For those who are concerned about the politicization of the Supreme Court towards one end of the spectrum or the other, what would it say to the country if even someone with Judge Jackson's background, experiences, and qualifications cannot earn bipartisan support from the Senate. Hmm. Thank you so much, Senator. I think it would be a sad day in America. As my friend and colleague Wayne Henderson said earlier, when we look at this confirmation and we look at voting rights and when we look at all the things that you are debating today, it is the fundamental grounding of our society and our communities. So I think today, how can you say on both sides of the aisle, as Senator Tillis looked at me and said, he and his colleagues agree that she is exceptionally qualified. Then we have heard about the cases that have been brought before us that have been in question by some of my colleagues on the other side, 10 cases, but it was five, but they were still within the rule of the law that she was given to deal with. So if you look at all the charts that we've seen with all the boxes to be checked, more than any other justice that some of the same people here have voted for and confirmed when questions about cases in the same vein have appeared, she still is above all of them. So the answer to that question is, how can we not? And as a black woman who've lived through civil rights and everything else, let's send the right message. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Henderson. Senator Padilla, your question is so powerful, particularly after you restated, as you did so eloquently, all of the factors that have brought Judge Jackson to this moment. Her background is absolutely extraordinary. And her demonstration and mastery of the law is second to none. If someone, an American citizen, who has overcome the challenges 
in one's life that she has overcome demonstrated her ability beyond any reasonable doubt and in, is unable to get the bipartisan support of members of this committee. Indeed, it is a sad day for this country. The signal that it sends to American, the American people is that at the end of the day, preparation may not be the standard by which you are measured. And instead, something else, intangible perhaps, in this process comes through. That's not what we want for America. That's not what we in the civil rights movement have struggled for our professional lives to help bring to this country. It would be a sad day. Uh, my hope is that the partisan considerations that may have affected some in the questioning of Judge Jackson will be set aside. And that members of this committee, out of their love for the country and its people and the future of the court, will do what's right and will make Judge Jackson a unanimously confirmed appointment. Now, I'm dreaming. That's not going to happen. But certainly, I think sending a signal to the country that indeed we recognize the qualifications that she brings to the table and we lift them up in the name of the American people is something that I hope we can all do. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Senator Padilla, and thank you to the panel. Um, and I welcome all of you uh, to this room and thank you for your contribution to this historic uh, occasion. Uh, I said at the outset, and I want to repeat now, my gratitude to my ranking Republican member, Senator Grassley, a true gentleman and friend uh, who believes, as I do, that this is one of the most important assignments in a Senate career to be on the Judiciary Committee at this moment in history. Uh, I believe that the admonition of the leader on the Republican side, Senator McConnell, that our hearing be fair and respectful of the nominee was largely upheld by uh, the members of the committee. Uh, and I hope that we can continue in that vein. But before we close today, I want to mention those who have helped enable this hearing to run so smoothly. Gratitude starts with the officers of the United States Capitol Police. These officers keep members and sa staff safe every single day. But this week, we've asked them to take on a greater task. Keep us safe, keep our buildings secure, and ensure that the guests in attendance play by the rules. I can't thank them enough for all the hours they put in to that, toward that mission. I also want to thank the staff from the architect of the Capitol, Senate Sergeant at Arms, Senate Recording and Press Galleries, and others who work so hard to set up this room and give access to the public and press and to keep this hearing running. Finally, a special thanks to the committee staff designated and otherwise who have worked tirelessly on behalf of members and staff on both sides of the aisle. I'll have more thanks to offer in the weeks ahead, but again, my deepest gratitude to all who have made this hearing a success. Please note the record will remain open until 5 p.m. next Thursday for the submission of letters, statements for the record, and similar materials. And with that, the Senate Judiciary Committee stands adjourned.